welcome to Varm Blog. Although Elijah comes on enough that we should probably give this its own title eventually. I give everything else a title, but I have no idea what I would call it. I was thinking about calling it Two Heaps Talk About Lash, but eventually we'll get done with talking about Lash. Um, it, it'll be like Lash Talk, like Car Talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, today we're talking about the last two chapters in this book, The Minimal Self. Uh, got my good old Norton edition, and I know it's old because the retail price is 10 bucks. So, um, let's see, when was this printed actually? Yeah, this is this is an actual 1984 edition, so <laughs> OG here. Um, Now, we're talking specifically about, and I'm just going to give people the chapter titles. This is chapter six, The Politics of the Psyche. And we're going to go into chapter seven, The Ideological Soul on the Ego, um, which is a long chapter, actually. Uh, but those are the last two chapters in the book. And while they are kind of different from culture of narcissism and that Lash learned more about different categorizations of narcissism and kind of neo-Freudian theory from the 50s, 60s. And also takes an explicit position. Yeah. Um, well, let's go into that. What is Lash's position on narcissism before we get into the politics of the, of the self? So Lash uh, makes clear something that he didn't in the previous book, which is that he thinks that narcissism is useful as a mode of analysis because mm -hmm. it illuminates the question, the right questions. And he makes clear that he thinks it's an approach which has been taken because the other approaches, the politics of the superego and the politics of the ego, have so exhausted and disgraced themselves because of the existence of World War II and the remainder of the 20th century. Um, and so his position on narcissism is it asks the right questions and comes up with the wrong answers. So let's let's dig into this a little bit because a lot of people get stuck on narcissism as a psychoanalytic category and they identify that with narcissistic personality disorder and the and the diagnostic and statistical manual which it is not. We are not talking about the same thing and that needs to be understood. Um in fact, I would actually go so far as to say narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder is not actually contiguous, although it's related to analytic, uh, psychoanalytic conceptions of narcissism, and neither one of them are quite exactly Lash's conception of narcissism, um, which is confusing. But what are you going to do? I mean, one of the things that you have to realize about narcissism, and I think uh, it came up in an interview I did with Daniel Tutt, but it's something that I've thought about for a while. People think that narcissism is being in love with the self, that the, the, the myth is, is that narcissists fell in love with himself. And the way Freud and later Freudians actually take it is not that narcissists fell in love with himself, is narcissists did not know the boundaries of the self and drowned in it. Yeah, to lash the explicit danger is the lack of recognition that right. the the characteristic quality of narcissism is a blurring of the boundaries between the self and the outside world. Right, and um, I think we can go into this in subject object thought going all the way back to Hegel. Like the reason why the blurring of the boundaries is so important is that it it prevents self formation. That self formation actually is predicated on distinguishing yourself from someone else picking up the ability to communicate that differentiation through the means of someone else through language through culture through through economic activity and being able to socially reproduce yourself in ways that continue that differentiation with others um which is you know lash is also one of these figures who really understands that the I, the individualism and collectivism problem is, is 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 a false binary. Like you don't have one without the other. Um, it is it is against the collective of which an individual is defined. Lash gets that, um, 
And I think even in talking about this in like modern psychological terms, that those kinds of frameworks are still more or less true. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think people get hung up when we get, particularly when we get into these chapters on the fact we are operating with Freudian categories and not like post 1990s uh psychotherapy neurological or disorder categories like that's not really what's going on here yeah um yeah i mean this this precedes uh precedes the the common understandings we have this is from a time i think that this is something that that really gets to me when psychoanalysis as a um as a discipline was a lot more co- you know confident of itself Mm-hmm. And of its interaction with politics that has been true for most of the past 30 to 40 years. Um, you know, so he's engaging with these in part because psychoanalysis was, you know, had these totalizing and, and huge ambitions, uh, which he goes into in these chapters. Um, and so he thinks it's, it's becoming the most relevant category of debate across society. Right. Now, I think that's that's interesting um, just to to get into what we're going to talk about versus what we talk about with MPD just before we get into the social stuff here. I don't think you could do what Lash is doing with like modern categories from the DSM, which is uh, narcissistic personality disorder with the with the. Um, three subtypes, which is grandiose, fragile, and, and, uh, exhibitionistic. Um, and that's interesting. Uh, you could do something with like, um, communal narcissism, I guess, which is something that is not really recognized in the diagnostic and, 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 uh, statistical manual and even the way that we think about it from the dsm-4 which is unprincipled amorous compensatory elitist and normal uh versus of narcissistic personality disorder again didn't exist yet the earliest framework that we have uh is probably cohuts which is like what is that is that where the type one and type two or is it erickson where the type one and type two come from do you know i don't know i'm not i'm not super familiar with it yeah, that's a problem. Uh, one of the problems with Lashes is, is even though he's fairly recent, um, you know, this book was published in my lifetime, barely in my lifetime, but in my lifetime. Yeah, but you he's, read it like all of the people he's talking about are like non-existent at this point, basically. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is when I was going through this, like to go back, particularly more interestingly, more this book. Than culture of, uh, of narcissism, which I find this interesting. The names in here and the critiques he's talking about have been largely dropped from public discourse. Mm-hmm. We did not pick this up. Though, though I will say when I was going through it, I thought a lot of the assumptions that he was talking about built into, say, ego psychology or behavioral psychology are still super relevant. Oh, um, yeah. And so what's funny about this is that as this has become less descriptive of the psychological terrain it retains a lot of uh, descriptivity of of politics i think it's more descriptive of politics frankly than it did in 1984 like um which which puts you in this weird place with it because let's start off with the first assertion from the politics of the psyche and that is the reason why it is better to frame this in terms of psychoanalytic categories is everybody from conservative to liberal to far left to new leftist um, has internalized whether they realize it or not and in different ways that the personal is political. Um, So he starts from that assumption that the personal is political and has collapsed politics like we think about it. And thus we have to model politics on something like a model of the individual mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's interesting when you think about all the political temperament shit that we've seen for the past 15 years, a lot of which is empirically interesting, but it's hard to explain the past with it. Um, 
because like for example the biggest predictor of political temperament seems to be either genetic or age and then how but then you're like well how the hell do you explain the fact that th that we weren't evenly distributed politically you know for most of our history that's really a post 1980s phenomenon um where political temperaments and political ideology are aligned and there's some stuff that Lash got me thinking about. I'm going to float as we talk about this. When I was when I was thinking about this, is one of the things that uh, Daniel Besner points out is we're actually in a moment of mass identification with politics, but actual politics is the least populist that it's been. And populist, not in the sense of like there's a populist movement because there is one, but populist and that popular opinion actually has an effect on policy because it just yeah. empirically kind of doesn't. <clears throat> um. So I think it's interesting to me because this adds something to life. If you, if you take the 70s as the beginning of the move away from populist politics into this more um, truly neoliberal managed terrain, and I'm using neoliberal here specifically, I'm not using it generically. Um, I mean... Like the specific instantiation of financialized capitalism, where the state creates a whole lot of markets and kind of forces people into them indirectly. Um, that I find this to be particularly helpful, and maybe we, as we get into this, why this still holds up, even though that the social reproduction schemes that he talks about in the culture of narcissism have cool. collapsed yeah. and they're done. Like, yeah. I mean, um, I, I think, I think that the whole what he's talking about in this book is, as you say, it's the collapse of that social reproduction scheme and the coming of a new political order, which is neoliberalism. Um, and it, it's, it's an I, go ahead. It's an identification of the new boundaries of debate within neoliberalism, um, or what their possibilities are. And so well, I was it, actually thinking of this in the context of the seven thesis on American politics, which you've been going into. Mm -hmm. you know, so much of it is focused on class dealignment. I was thinking, well, actually, this describes in many ways much more the realignment of the parties uh, yeah. around assumptions of what locus of control is possible um, in some yeah. ways, but not all. We go in the seven, the seven thesis by uh, Dylan Riley and, and Robert Brenner, who, which... When you listen, you will find out how angry I get at this thesis is actually um, because most of it isn't new. Mm -hmm. um, and with Matt Karp's response, which I find also not particularly, I, I find it descriptively compelling and accurate. But as he says, it's not causal. He doesn't actually explain the causes. He's just describing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting, though, when he, what he bases the breakdown in, because it, it becomes economics, but it doesn't manifest that way. Uh, he, I'll just read verbatim what he says. Long established distinctions between left and right, liberalism and conservatism, revolutionary politics and reformist politics, progressive and reactionary, are breaking down in the face of new questions about technology, consumption, women's rights, environmental decay, and nuclear armaments. Questions to which no one has a ready-made ready answers. What I find interesting about right now um, is, with the exception of environmental decay, these have all been questions, and they've been questions settled actually by government collusion mm -hmm. with the market. Um, which I find I find interesting because Lash seems to both kind of understand. I mean, you know, and it's hard to f f fault him for this in 1984. He kind of understands what's happening, but not entirely. Like, I don't think anybody would have been completely understood the level of financialization that really started to happen from 1976 forward um, until probably about the middle of the 80s, which is when Lash really gets concerned about neoliberalism proper. Like, you know. And I think if you look at the earlier, um, the earlier books, mm -hmm. and a lot of the writings by the new left, they assume that the response to a profitability crisis is going to be either total societal breakdown and revolution or 
fascism. Yeah. And neoliberalism is neither of those things. Right. Um, which, which, by the way, is my big warning about people who think we're in a final crisis right now, because we've seen this before. Yeah. The history of left wing writing is like basically people saying we're in a final crisis and then being proven wrong. Yeah. All the way back to 1850. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> so... So and, and it, that comes up in this book too, but in another chapter about yeah. the, apoc the apocalyptic nature of of current politics. So this is him. That that chapter, I should say, is not Lash saying we're in a final crisis. It's him kind of like being like, "Man, I was so wrong about saying we were in a final crisis." Right. Um, it, it, it's like it's almost him saying like, "Well, I believed in Sweezy too much that crises were over. Then I thought we were in a final crisis. Now I think like." Maybe they're cycles and they're bad. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, it, it, adoption of the business cycle mentality. Um, which, is, which is interesting, though, because Lash was actually early to realize that. Yeah. Well, he's I think he's and I think that this is actually a good example of he's early to a lot of things, which is why he's so interesting to read still mm -hmm. um, and why he remains very relevant today. Can I say I, ha I think we have two main tasks before us this evening. Okay. Yes. Um, which is illuminating the parties of the psyche and what he means about them in the context of his own time and then discerning whether or not they're still relevant today and precisely how. Yeah. One of the things that I will say when I was reading these um, parties of the psyche is that I now see where Lash says they still vaguely line up to uh conservative liberal and new left you know roughly he doesn't he he does say it's not useful to totally think about them that way um but that you can kind of see alignments with them i think now you really can't like it's i can't say that the left is the party of the anything or the but right I, is the party of the anything what i kind of noticed is that there's no party of the super ego left in american life um and that one thing that has so the party of the super ego to premise this yeah, it's the first party, so let's go there. Stand. So, very simply, quote, they regard a restoration of the social superego and of strong parental authority as the best hope of social stability and cultural renewal. Um, in this case, the party of the superego is taking account of, like, the general collapse in society in the 70s, and they're saying that the reason why is that there's a disrespect for institutions, there's a disrespect for parents, uh, basically modernism has like destroyed everything, authority has declined, and people have to have a renaissance of guilt, in the words of Philip Reif, uh, to stem the rising tide of impulse. Yeah, basically we've got to put down this Dionysian revolt, no more Nietzsche. Bad, Absolutely. Bad. Um, um, Lash uh, devotes very little time to this, in part because it's very simple to understand. There's a repressive apparatus of laws and moral dogmas which enforce moral conformity, he says. Um, but at the same time, more interestingly, he says that there's little confidence in external controls, laws against pornography and abortion, or the restoration of the death penalty, except as symbolic expressions of shared beliefs from these people. Yeah, uh, so, yeah basically, like, we're going we're gonna to prevent abortion. We've given up. I mean, if there is a party of the super ego it might be radical feminist now because everybody else has given up on pornography at all. And um, except for, well, it's interesting because the only place I see this is in, is in not even in paleo conservatism, really, it's really specifically in the subset of like post paleo conservatism. They're using an awful phrase I coined right now, but in like Catholic anti-liberal national conservatism i think there's like... there's some of the post liberals i would describe this way because i've talked to a lot of them i like hanging out with them i hope they never gain power um and yeah, I, I like some of them too i just hope they stay in church yeah like... yeah um and what's fascinating about them is that they like are probably the most like 
socially conservative people active in American politics in a lot of ways. And they have and they no absolutely no faith that government would succeed in exterminating any of the things they dislike. Right. Which uh, is interesting that, but that goes back to Christian thought, like all the way back to Augustine, like Augustine thought like we can't even ban the prostitution houses because something's yeah. got to keep everything together. So like <laughs> what, what these people want is like a just hugely congruent moral authority, which will, in, you know, implant a guilt impulse in people and use that to repress people's worst impulses. Some of them actually do want a theocracy, but most of them don't have faith in anyone to do it. Like, I think about Ron Dreyer, who's just basically like, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, he's, he's, his Benedict option is like, flee for the hills, wait yes. for a time, come back. It's um, basically like a revenant, uh, a remnant political thought, which was also a big thing in paleoconservatism, but not, a, not as much about religion. Um, and, and, you know, it almost like, it's like canonical for Leibowitz, but like with actual religion this time. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who don't know the reference, canonical for Leibowitz is like a bunch of scientists end up saving society by becoming monks, kind of. Um, it's interesting who he, who he identifies because these are names that are still relevant. Interesting. We, because it's two conservatives in an old liberal. Um, he, he identifies uh, Philip Reef, who is, you know, our hyper-conservative Freudian friend, um, who is conservative in the small C, though, because he's not really always politically conservative. He's weird politically. Um, Daniel Bell, are the the person most likely to be misread as having the same opinion as Lash, and that's a total mistake. Or liberal. Yeah. He's like an or liberal, but he's a conservative liberal. Like yeah. but he um you know a liberal a liberal republican in, in the old sense of that and Leon and, and Lionel Tr uh, Trilling, who's like the er like American liberal post Trotskyist like I was never a Marxist, but I hung out with the partisan review guys and I didn't become a neoconservative. Mm -hmm. Like, but those are your three. Yeah. Right. And Philip Reef has only, I think, become relevant again because of all the neo Freudianism that's become popular on the left. So, so that's why we know him. Um, but, but Trilling and Daniel Bell, I think, are still readily referenced in red. Yeah, um, uh, especially Bell, in my experience. Yeah. Um, um, I know a lot of people who know Trilling too, actually. But it's it it. I will admit it's it's people my age. Yeah, I I was gonna say maybe it's a generational function. Yeah, it's it's um, it's like Gen Xers who know Trilling. But I think anyway, like the fact that these are the citations, that this is the description, this is the simplest party to understand. Yeah, moral uh, consensus. He, so, he calls them the neoconservatives, basically. He's like, they're basically neoconservatives. He doesn't call them the neoconservatives. He says, to explain them, think of them as similar to the neoconservative position. And so reading this, I was thinking, wow, there's really not that many people who adhere to the superego in American politics anymore. Um, people have lost faith since the Bush administration in its ability to provide a governing moral consensus. Uh, and the stuff where he was talking about in terms of cultural conservatism. A governing, a governing moral consensus, let's add something to that. That is positive. That is positive. Yes. I think that there's, there's an, a, a, a huge element of this is a negative component that remains. Mm -hmm. um, but that Lash doesn't exactly call the party the superego. So, for example, he, he talks about how there's a number of right wingers who uh, have no faith in the superego at all. Um, Either they seek to simply enforce moral and political conformity through outright coercion, or in the case of many free market conservatives, they take the same libertarian view of culture that they take towards economics. Um, the first approach relies not on conscience, but on pure compulsion. The second cannot properly be called conservative at all. Uh, a truly conservative position on culture rejects both enforced conformity and laissez-faire. Um, and... The conservatives who we see most frequently follow that description. They're kind of like debased conservatives in Lash's in Lash's vision. Yeah, they're either they're either libertarians who are also losing, but there's still a few of them. And are there 
if they if they represent the superego, they are only the repressive element. They're not the self controlling element. Yeah, there's no element of self control. There's just the the and I think Lash's description of what the debased superego is follows very neatly that. Uh, so at, it's when he's explaining why it's not a good uh, solution to cultural problems. In fact, the superego never serves as a reliable agency of social discipline. It bears too close a kinship to the very impulses it seeks to repress. It relies too heavily on fear. Its relentless condemnation of the ego breeds a spirit of sullen resentment and insubordination. It's, only it, it's endlessly reiterated, thou shalt not surround sin with the glamour and excitement of the forbidden. In our culture, the fascination with violence reflects the severity with which violent impulses are prescribed. It also reflects the violence of the superego itself, which re redirects murderous resentment of authorities against the ego. Uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah. So basically, it's the Dionysian excesses of owning the libs. Yeah. Which is purely... It is even self-destructive. That's the thing. Like, and for for liberals to try to fight, it's actually interesting because it's not like a call to hypocrisy is not going to work. That would that might might, and, and this leads. This is one of the things where I think thinking about this politics of of psyche is actually helpful. Um, liberals have a tendency to take the, and and, and we're going to talk about liberals not being their part either, but. Uh, liberals have a tendency to take the current authority mongering and cult of personality ness of, of the current right and retroject that to the right all the way back to, I don't know, Calhoun or something. And that's wrong. Like that does that you can't really understand the conservatism of the 40s, 50s, and 60s that way at all. Like, nor can you understand it merely as like the people who enforce the market, because that's not really where it comes from. Um, this is all very new. And, you know, the reason why Lash is writing this is because Reagan is a new type of conservatism, which is one out in American life at the time he's writing this, mm -hmm. which is the fusionist between the neoconservative, uh, the like libertarian and the cultural conservative. Yeah, model. the Christian conservative, really. Mm -hmm. The Christian conservative. And that's super weird. That never existed before. And, and so it's been yeah. on what unites them, which is, you know, a superego, a faith in the superego. Um, in the case of like the, the libertarians, I think it, it's also like, especially culturally or Christian, like Christian free marketeers. Uh, one thing to remember, like the reason why they don't believe in the necessity of regulation uh, is in part because they think that moral prohibitions alone will account will will solve the most pressing problems that come from a lack of regulation. Yeah. Although sometimes it's also because they want a theocracy, and if the state's weak, that would be easier to impose. Like, I mean, like there's absolutely. a reason why Gary North and, and uh, Rush Dooney hung out with libertarians. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. But the um, the average, like your average normal Christian conservative, who you're like, does not think that. No, they they don't think that. They're like, uh, if people are moral and act more moral then the world of competitive you know, business will not extend to desiccating and destroying everything in American life. Um, right. With that, I think we've covered the party of the superego. Should we go on to the, the liberal ego? Or, the liberal uh, ego and the therapeutic ethic, which I think this one's interesting. Although I do want to read what he predicts is going to happen from the party of the superego. Go for it. A government that preaches are in order, but fails to guarantee public safety to reduce the crime rate or to address the underlying causes of crime can no longer expect citizens to internalize the, expect, the respect for law from top to bottom of our society. Those who uphold law morality find themselves unable to maintain order and to hold out the rewards formerly associated with the usurpance of social rules. Even middle-class parents find it increasingly difficult to provide secure environment for their offspring or to pass on social and economic advantages of the middle-class status, which is absolutely true. Um, Nepo babies don't come from the middle-class anymore because the middle-class cannot secure that much en enough to ensure any division of their wealth amongst their children. And they don't have many children. Like, and they don't have much wealth. <laughs> no. I mean, um, so furthermore, I, I've, I'm going to say something about American religion. I, I've been 
really big on like even if nominal religion is still around, it's utterly secularized because Christians no longer see their morality as separate from their politics, meaning their 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 morality, all our religion does not really have a pull. It is it it doesn't have it's it, it can't the social order that might come from that separately from whatever the fads and gusts of sentiment are in general society, most religious orders can no longer handle, which is why stuff like Trump doesn't matter. Like, um, and it's, and interestingly, I, I get annoyed with Jeff Charlotte because he thinks that the fundamentalists are always winning. Um, but one observation that he makes is there was a shift in the kind of religious religiosity of the, of the, of Protestants, which was no longer constraining, but actually one of like power indulgence and uh, forgiveness of the powerful, moving the model to like forgiving David and and his battle with Saul. Um, meaning that like this new secularized religion totally accommodates for someone like Trump, and he can be sincerely religious and not change anything about himself, which. Which means that religion does not have a moral pool. It is no longer a. It is no longer a form. It is no longer one of the components of subject formation. It's now subject to that formation. Um, I, I, I used to talk about this with Buddhism, which is a religion that I've been involved with, so I know a lot more about. And like, I used to complain about Western Buddhists, but it's. I mean, I'm going to actually say it's also true in most countries in Asia that Buddhist moral codes have totally like been subsumed to whatever the local dominant politics are um and often incorporate like in america there's like this protestant individualism that's kind of in it and if you're in korea it's like fil filial piety and if you know anything about buddhism that make any sense but buddhists don't care about filial piety but they do there um so you see a similar pattern and i think for similar reasons um, to go all to be a vulgar Marxist about it is because most of these religions don't answer questions or deal with needs concurrent in most people's material life in the same way anymore. It, like it can't hold up against the pressures of atomization of community through literally through property relations and whatnot. Um, and the ones that do, like say Orthodox Jews various cults used to be evangelicals but they folded um have a, a, a an extremely strong component of social organization yeah uh, and they're also isolated they have to isolate themselves like and that's hard like even like the amish are having trouble doing it now so um i think this is actually the perfect pivot because this is what lash next touches upon in mm -hmm. his description of the development of the liberal ego uh, the 19th century origins of the therapeutic ethic, what he talks about is he talks about the pivot from uh, the rebellion against uh, against Calvinism, actually, um, and the pivot to from Jacob Abbott uh, to say that vindictive re retribution for sin was giving way to remedial punishments administered. So the idea is that punishment for sin is now for your own good. Yeah, it's corrective as opposed to to purgative or do you punitive. punish people. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and this is the little bit of lash where you can you can feel the his his early dalliances with Foucault. Um, I was thinking that this whole time that he really should engage more with Foucault in this, but right. Well, he did early on. I mean, you, you you've read early lash too, yeah. like there's in lot... this specific section. He's he like, yeah, he's not. Uh oh, Brown and Marcuse. A lot of his his commentary on Marcuse is like answered in some ways by Foucault, right? Um, like the surplus repression stuff and the his the historicization of that, which we'll get to, um, is similar to a lot of elements of Foucault's project. But, right. but yeah, uh, sorry. So here, let's deal with the first names that are invoked. Talcott Parsons, which for everyone knows is a kind of conservative. Max Weber. I say everyone. No one knows that. If you're a sociologist, 
and you're familiar with sociology before the 90s. You have to know Talcott Parsons. But what's interesting is like all the younger people, like people who are my age actually are your age, do not. And Talcott Parsons is referenced and all the people we read, but we don't know who he is. Yeah. If um, you're addicted to Lash, you have to know Talcott Parsons. Right. Well, you also have to know him for another person I read, which is John Michael Levy. Because John Michael Levy uses Talcott Parsons for as the example of everything bad. We have, we sociology. have the, the, second, the second example of that here also, which is John Dewey. Right. Uh, Lash's version of that. Yeah, everyone's asking me, like, you're like, well, Lash, Lash doesn't seem to understand John Dewey. I'm like, no, Lash maybe understands John Dewey. He just hates him. Yeah, he like, despises John Dewey. He, he, like, that's, and what's interesting to me is, like, that's consistent in all periods of Lash. Whenever John Dewey comes up, he's pissed off. Yeah, um, he's, if you want to understand Lash, just, like, open to any random page. He's saying John Dewey is bad and accommodation of the Soviet Union must be reached. <laughs> Those are like through everything. Yeah, like we need to taunt maybe just a little bit of socialism over here. And uh, the elimination of John Dewey's influence in American life. Yeah, uh, and we should we should remove all references to John Dewey from history and burn everything. <laughs> I mean. Um, no, he wouldn't want him removed from history, but he would yeah. want him anathematized. I mean, like, it, he wants people to learn about him for the purpose of demonstrating that, you know, uh, with an, an attitude of genuine mourning that we engaged in in his uh, his theories. Um, yeah. But I I do think here there's something very important which he talks about right in this first section, mm -hmm. uh, which is that uh, when he's talking about Parsons' idea of the family and Dewey's idea of the school. Uh, and their comparison of democratic authority to science, they say it achieves its greatest success precisely in assuring its own supersession. And so that to him is an underpinning element of the goal of the party of the ego in terms of cultural questions, to assure that it is possible for its own order to be superseded. So what I find interesting about this, I was thinking about uh, Michael Sandel's, uh, who we know Lash actually engaged with, with uh, when he was alive. Um, um, Michael Sandel's understanding of American democracy, which is uh, civic republicanism, slowly shifting in gradients to administrative state. And then in his most recent revision of democracy's discontents, he actually says that that's over too. We're not even pretending to be an administrative state anymore basically things are run by crisis now um nice. and and the tyranny and the tyranny of supposed merit that's basically how he thinks things are are viewed um and what i find interesting about here is the lib the liberal ego and it's interesting that he does say it's liberal after saying that we can't think of this in terms of liberal conservative but that liberal ego politics is therapeutic and, and um, reformative, but uh, it also sees itself as values neutral or are approaching values neutrality. It's, it, it, it compares itself to science. Right. Uh, it's, it sees itself as, I think, essentially procedural, uh, which is a really important designation. And I think it's something which has a lot of relevance today. Um, in terms of the way in which democratic politicians especially and democratic elite politics especially, but Republican elite politics for the most part, with the exception of like Trump himself, uh, how they see oh, themselves. Them. I think DeSantis is, uh, he fits into like some of this uh, in in terms of like the faith and in expertise. Um like DeSantis is basically calling for alternative expertise. There was an article by, by Sam Adler Bell uh, that came out like today or yesterday talking about how the project of DeSantis is the same as the project of conservatism for a while, which is the replacement of liberal expertise by conservative expertise and a new consent. Um, 
A new consensus. You just faded for a second. Uh, a new consensus for elite politics. Right. Which which leads to it like mirroring its misunderstanding of Gramsci through the long marts of institutions, something that Gramsci never actually yeah. said we should do. But but interestingly, I think it's actually and weirdly, uh Subraba Mari pointed this out of all people, um over the Compact magazine that it means that they're actually taking over the cultural institutions that are dying. Like they're like they're like they're going, we're going to do a conservative university when universities are yeah. shrinking rapidly. Yeah. I mean, if like if they really want, you know, to to win, what they they the smart ones understand they have to take over the CIA. Um, but unfortunately, it's not particularly stable to the American government to have conservatives in charge anymore. Uh, because like and because I thought they're no I, longer the party of the super ego. Well, they're no longer the party of the super ego because the, the result of boosted tax cuts and like the elimination of regulations that businesses themselves have asked asked for. Um so I was thinking about this in terms of the uh the delayed gratification thing, um, which Lash talks about. So he talks about how the uh rational ego which is the basis of this party uh is compared to both it, it, it's it's opposed to both impulse and inherited morality um and it wants a person who's emancipated from custom and prejudice and patriarchal constraints uh and is basically utilitarian in its aims yeah. in some way or another and it, in its conception of the self and its conception of the individual john rawls john rawls um, and, uh, my bet are more than Dewey, but go ahead. And the, the, um, the whole principle of this is delayed gratification, the classic, like bourgeois individual. Uh, and can I know, add to that, that I think empirical sure. cultural stuff now, like people go like, well, you know, conservatives, they're really indulgent with their children, whereas liberals aren't, this has been observed now in two generations, like from the nineties forward. And and I'm like, yeah, it makes sense because the therapeutics all about a belief in in remediation, a belief in meritocracy, and a belief in, in delayed gratification um, as a form of building. Um, yeah, so but it's but it's premised on a neutral system uh, of which still shows up in our like people go, but this doesn't make sense. Liberals are all about like. Uh, victimization and privilege. I'm like, well, notice that they said privilege because privilege implies that there's a neutrality somewhere of which everyone could possibly have the same social access and the same social backing if you just figured out the right handicaps to remove mm -hmm. um, yeah. or and lowered everybody to the same shitty expectation. I don't want it. The, uh, the objective is um, is procedural fairness. And uh, the assumption is that all problems are solvable. And I just, I have to say on, in terms of the delayed gratification, there was a mm -hmm. game that I played when I was like, you know, at like eight, I'm, I'm from like a liberal ego family. Uh, I'll say Gross. Uh, where I was given like a choice. I was given a marshmallow. And if I waited eight minutes to eat the marshmallow, I would get a second marshmallow, uh, which is like something you do to like a dog. I don't know. Yeah, but um, that was based off of something that you heard 10 years ago, 15 years ago, actually, all the time about teaching people to lay gratification off of a test that was done in the 60s, which if you actually followed the longitudinal outcomes of that test, you discovered that it wasn't just the delayed gratification, that part of the reason people didn't delay gratification was also that they already had certain social disadvantages. And so it was rational for them yeah. not to. So I, I, that, that is a result, but I'm just illustrating that like the belief in delayed gratification is extremely strong. Damn liberal Jews. <laughs> really shining through here, except that it's especially shining through when Lash says that uh, liberal education drew on the cultural capital of the past more heavily than it realized. You know, that's the, uh, that's the, the liberal Jewish connection. Yeah. Um, it's on the cultural capital of the past.
I think this is also interesting because uh, I would actually say a lot of current left uh, cyberneticists are guilty of this too, because there's way more behaviorism in their. You mentioned that later. Have you? Did you see? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, there's way more. I saw that. More Um, behaviorism in their stuff, and I'm like, nobody's a behaviorist anymore. The behaviorist lost. (laughs) But let me let me read this because I think it's helpful. Today, the morality of enlightened self-interest lives on in behavioral psychology. And if you think about the positive, this is me talking. If you think about the positive psychology debates that we were going to have like 30 years from this, oh my God, is this predictive? Uh, Which conceives of moral education and moral conditioning accomplished largely through positive reinforcement. A behaviorist like B.F. Skinner stands squarely in the utilitarian tradition when he insists that punishment and an effective form of social control has to give way to non-aversive controls. Skinner's belief that science can become a basis for a better moral cult in which there is no need for moral structure restates another tenet of utilitarianism modified, as we shall see, by the overlay of 20th century progressivism. I think I think even amongst a lot of the left, <coughs> Ben Burgess, my friend, uh, this is still an assumption. And uh, this is one of the reasons I emphasize why Marxists can't be utilitarians. Like, we believe in struggle, period. We don't think it's possible not to. So, um, a, a not like a, a society that doesn't have struggle would have to have abolished a whole lot of stuff that we don't think current society could abolish. Um, nor do we think, nor do I think that that would necessarily get rid of all forms of struggle anyway. Um, and but, it, I don't think it would be desirable to get rid of all forms of struggle. No. Which is where I agree with Lash. Uh, and that's basically his conclusion, but we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, you have to... yeah. It's interesting, though, how much he talks about how this is rooted in a shift in theology. Sorry, I cut out. Yeah, you cut out. I said, interesting though, how much this is rooted in a shift in theology. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. Um, and I mean, it, it does reveal it's, uh, you know, that it's a shift in the basis of American moral life from basically theological to basically scientific. Interesting. So. I find this section on uh, psychoanalysis and the liberal tradition of moral optimism to be to be very interesting because he basically critiques early Freudians for being too fucking liberal, and, yeah, <laughs> uh, and too and also too too integrated in a kind of liberal Anglicanism or or something. Um, you know, he talks about Ernest Groves and, Will- and Wilfred Lay and Edwin Holt, not names that we could st- hear a lot anymore. Um, he seems to be siding with Philip Reef that like Freud's a moralist, but he has a very dismal view of of human will. Like, yeah, he's got the we, the great quote, according to Freud, psychoanalytic therapy could only hope to substitute every day on a happiness for debilitating neurosis. Um, and it makes people reconciled to the sacrifices exacted by civilized life uh, or, or make them easier to bear. But it's not going to cure anything. Uh, he also gets on to Adler and Young here. I mean... <laughs> Now, I like Adler, actually, but, you know, um, the Adler, like, strips out the sexual content uh, and substitutes, you know, basically Nietzsche, um, which I, which, you know, my, my friend uh, Daniel Tutt will tell me is not as readily in Freud as I think it is. I'm like, Freud is very, very Nietzsche, and he's he's always arguing with me about that because he he thinks Nietzsche is an uber reactionary, which I kind of agree with. And he's trying to make the case that Freud isn't, which I, uh, I also agree with, but not because he's not a Nietzschean. <laughs> like, um, but anyway, and then Young for moving it into mysticism and woo crap. Uh, Though yeah, I think it's, it's significant that Young is like very popular today. I mean, Jordan Peterson is a Jungian. Yeah, he is. Um, and Which, so 
and it's, it's very popular amongst these fucking uh, conservative Christians. Um, and I say that with the, with disdain because they don't even know they're heretics. Like there is a there, there is a way in which Jordan Peterson and all of his complaint about postmodern neo Marxism is actually postmodernified uh, through symbolic reinterpretation most of the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I've said, like, you can't even tell if he believed, actually Peterson has the same problem as Lash. You don't know if they believe in God, but they seem, seem to want to like, that's funny. But, I like that. <laughs> um, if they were Jewish, they could get away with it, but they're Christian. So, uh, even Jungian mysticism in some ways, it's manifestation at least has a certain affinity with the liberal tradition, moral striving and spiritual self-help. Young saw the unconscious mind not as a tangled mess of desires, the Freudian view, but as a reservoir for collective experience of saving myths. And you do see this in, in Peterson. Yeah, I mean, his his whole thing is uh, is to impose order on chaos. Right. It's um, imposed order on chaos. It's, it is a therapeutic conservatism. He, yeah, he has like the chaos dragon. Uh, and all of his advice to like young men is like, make your bed. Treat yourself like somebody you're you're responsible for. Like it's pretty good advice, honestly. Or um, no, except for the hierarchy stuff, which is stupid. But yeah, but like the stuff like make your bed, like take care of yourself. That's good advice. Um, and what he does with it is he connects it to a broader therapeutic project, uh, and a project of like saving Western civilization, basically. And convincing his listeners that they are the recipients of the liberal tradition, actually, the classical liberal tradition. Which um, in some ways, so, you know, I know that what's interesting about who claims to be a classical liberal, right? Because it used to be libertarians claim it. I guess they still do. Now the Petersonites of the world claim it. Kind of on a libertarian bent, but not really. Um, my argument has always been except for the movements that try to transcend liberalism altogether, unless you're a blood and soil nationalist who believes in God and country, you're a liberal. Yeah. Um, um, the Yama one. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, and I know people hate that, but I'm like, no, like, yeah. Communism is, a, it does like the Ben Burgess platypus types, as much as they hate each other are both kind of right. The communism comes out of, uh, the liberal tradition what my distinction from them is i think we become something completely different yeah um uh, because fascism also comes out of the liberal tradition despite what liberals want to say um and uh, counter enlightenment is an enlightenment philosophy and postmodernism is a modernist uh way of life yeah totally Bo both of which are actually predicate i mean fundamentalism is actually dependent on the scientific revolution like all, all these things are like pseudo outs right um they meet a kind of need and i i want to say a lot of today when everyone's like the reason why i don't call people liberals anymore as an insult is because i think it's always true like Unless you're talking to someone from like India or or maybe China, and even there, I'm going to argue that there's been a synthesis with Chinese and and liberal certainly, thought. Uh, certainly in America, basically everyone is liberal. Yeah, um, including the people we call conservatives and the people we call socialists. Right. Um, I I th and I think one thing Lash gets on to is Lash is also speaking here of a particularly American conception of psychoanalysis and of the ego. Yeah. Um, if you see this, it's like, we talk about young, but it's really the American understanding of young. We talk about Carl Rogers. We talk about, uh, there's a um, quote from Rogers that I want to, uh, or his yeah. follower mm -hmm. Rogers own approach to therapy as a follower put it was quote, as American as apple pie end quote. Uh, and he's talking about free will total sensitivity to the client, empathy, unconditional positive regard, uh, congruence, and the importance of being real. Um, and discussing that every organism has an innate drive towards growth, health, and adjustment. And it stressed the possibility of achieving rational control over the self and the environment. So the liberal attitude in all of this 
is that there's growth, health, and adjustment without any objective standard beyond scientism. Um, and this is just going to continue the whole time we're talking about the, the liberal ego. Yeah. Um, I think that's a fair point. One of the things I, I think we have to deal with here is, is there are two forms of the liberal ego that are actually manifested in what we would now both consider out of date psychology, but both of these psychologies actually have antecedents that are still around. Mm -hmm. Um, because humanistic psychology, I think, largely fell out of the favor by the end of the 90s. I do, I did know some people went to college for it, but I don't know anyone anymore. Uh, and behaviorism is also largely fell out of favor. But cognitive behaviorism um, and positive psychology, which is related to cognitive behaviorism and its influence, it is actually still kind of an active debate in uh, American psychotherapeutic life. Um and it's also interesting that its practitioners admit that one, it's both the psychopharmaceutical and the behavior, and the kind of behavioral therapeutic claims are overstatements. Um, now they have to admit that because of the replication crisis. But the other issue that's actually kind of interesting is that there's been a shift in cognitive behaviorism from a kind of super ego approach to a much softer approach. If you like read early cognitive behavioral stuff uh, that's coming out in the 80s. Um, it's brutal, actually. It's like, you know, uh, it takes a very stoic approach to things. It's like, you know, the first thing you have to accept is like that there is no other way. There is no should. There only is what is. Don't start limiting counterfactuals and deal with now. Um, and what I find interesting is that that approach has completely softened. I don't know anyone who practices cognitive behavioral therapy quite like that anymore. Um, and humanistic psychiatry has kind of like just taken on a lot of the cognitive behavioral framework, but it repositioned itself as positive psychology, which has even less empirical background in the, like somebody was coming at me about, there's very little empirical background for death drive theory. And I'm like, yeah, but there's like also very little empirical background for kind of the behavioral therapy, for psychotherapeutic therapy, like like uh, are for any of those modalities being uh, being applicable in all cases. Like, for example, like dialectical behavioral therapy works on like one thing. It works on like borderline disorder, which people don't even agree with borderline exists. So even though it's in the DSM, it's a whole other thing. I bring it up though because I do think this actually is a split in liberalism. Like I think we I, see, I this, agree. You know, um, in the two kinds of ways liberals approach politics. So there's the game versus the growth therapies there, right? Um, and then there's ego psychology, which is like sort of within it, or is it separate? Uh, Sorry, I'm going through my my notes on this. Um, so basically, just as an overview, let's say what the difference is between behaviorism and humanistic psychiatry. Um, so there's there's game therapies, which is behaviorism, and growth therapies, which is humanistic psychiatry. Is that correct, Varn? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the game th therapies uh, are like Adler and the growth therapies are like Young, Lash says. Um, the goal of game therapies is, uh, is purely social, I think. Um, this part's a little dense. Um, and then the second one is... To is individual in the case of like having you grow, basically. Um, and I think the, the, the split that this shows within liberalism is a split between how to situate the individual. Do you sit, situate the individual within systems or do you have a conception of the individual separate from that? 
Would you say that that's an accurate uh, distinction? Yeah. So whether or not the individual is autonomous or systemic is actually the distinction here. Mm -hmm. That's really the only distinction because there's still an assumption of neutrality. So, for example, I, I always point out in the privilege versus power discussion, like I like when we talk about uh, relationships between races or, and whatnot, I, I don't talk about it in terms of privilege. I talk about it in terms of power relationships. And and that's because even though you're framing it in, in, in the systemic form, the privilege form assumes that somewhere rationally in the kernel there somewhere is a possibility in the current of a neutral relation which i think that language is i think it utterly betrays and like when i talk about power like no you you both can't have power like like it, yes there's a there are societies in which we could all have power but it's not this one like so I think that's an interesting and important distinction, even when leftists and liberals sound like they're talking about the same thing, the way they embed that and the way they talk about systems is actually really important. One thing I'd be interested to know what Lash would have made of is the fact that current liberalism really does focus, even when talking about systemic problems on individual subjective responses. Like we could talk about how much CRT focuses on, um, you know, intersexual analysis, but then when you see it actually applied, it's about like privilege recognition, making individual choices that are racist or anti-racist and setting up policies, you know, it's, and it's everything's also it's in that. Uh, it's cutting down the middle of this. It's trying to situate, focus on the situation of the individual within a system. Right. And blame the individual for that. Uh, but don't they don't blame because of course you know it's it's not a moral category it's it's objective right uh, except that yeah it's, i mean calling that objective as a category or but well, that's, that's what i was joking about <laughs> like but yeah i mean i i get i get what this means it's very hard to get people to like understand this where i'm like oh yeah there are objective things we can describe about power relations that are coded in race and we can go to sociological aggregates meaningfully, et cetera. Um, it's still important um, to, to understand why... Um, why when we talk about or try to flatten out these differences, I mean, and literally uh, one thing about C about modern CRT, I don't think it's actually true of current style early on uh, in intersectionality analysis, but modern CRT tries to recollapse this like explicitly by saying, we don't need to talk about systemic racism. We don't need to talk about implicit bias. We don't need to talk about interpersonal bigotry. It's all the same thing. It's racism. And I'm like, that's confusing as fuck. Like, that's literally collapsing self and system together into one conceptual apparatus. And one of the things I think we see in a lot of the current liberal debates is we still having this battle between the, between the behavioralist and the humanistic, but most of these movements are just collapsing them into mm -hmm. a really incoherent um, view of the therapeutic. Like... <laughs> I think we're we're actually talking now about two branches of the humanistic because I read ahead a little bit and then he's comparing these actually to Skinner, who is more relevant and is more purely behavior, you know, a behaviorist later. Mm -hmm. And I think is a really good, interesting political example. OK. Um, so Skinner is uh, Lash writes, he scandalizes liberals by carrying their own assumptions and prejudices to unpalatable conclusions makes explicit what liberal humanists prefer to ignore, that the therapeutic morality associated with 20th century liberalism destroys the idea of moral responsibility in which it originates, and that it culminates moreover in the monopolization of knowledge and power by experts. Um, and this is like the thing that Lash is, you know, against the whole of his career, uh, this particular strain of liberalism, which he sees as basically the culmination and the result of this strain before, 
that's unwilling to admit that by uh, assigning moral behavior an objective quality, what it's doing is it's monopolizing, uh, you know, the viable ways of living your life. Um, and it's implanting, you know, sort of a, a, a new form of totalitarianism in some way or another. Um, a milder form, but still one that tries to control every aspect of the being. So uh, cast on scene. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, the whole nudge Obama liberalism, which I think that kind of has gone away, um, but I'm not totally sure. Like, Biden and the current Democratic Congress is so incoherent in its framework, so it's very hard to tell what's actually... It's this very is, mixed up, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of these things where I disagree with Brennan and Riley, where he's like, the, he's a coherent neo-progressive. Like, Biden is a coherent anything. Yeah, like, he's got he's got a lot of different impulses um, which run into each other. Uh, I mean, he's he's just a pure politician uh, in comparison to like most of the people, you know, in comparison to Obama, Trump and Bush, who were all like weirdly. You know, who, who were not really like go with the flow people each in their own ways. I mean, Trump is like sort of like a go with the flow guy because he just like makes things up every day. Uh, and, you know, what, however he feels that morning, that's his politics now. Yeah. Um, but it's not particularly helpful for categorizing uh, in terms of a psychological assessment of the political landscape. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is interesting that I'm going to read this on Skinner. Skinner scandalizes liberals by carrying out their own assumptions and prejudice to an unpalatable conclusions. He makes explicit what liberal humanists prefer to ignore, that therapeutic morality associated with 20th century liberalism destroys the idea of moral responsibility in which it originates, and that it cultivates ultimately in a monopolization of knowledge and power by experts. Skinner is by no means a conservative, however. He shares liberal faith in the problems of modern organization, are administrative and psychological, not economic and political. Um, which I think is interesting because... because of the flattening out between politics and morality in and the and, and also systems as being somehow the responsibility of an individual but also based in the individual and manifested through the individual but also the individual is subject to it if you actually start pointing out the incoherence of this view um you end up triggering ironically moral panics because what you've actually done is remove the moral basis of anti-racism, anti-sexism or whatever by pointing out if we're consistent about this, there is no moral basis to this. You cannot shame people for this if you think they're all the same thing, which you have kind of said you do sometimes, you know, like, and, and I do think this is an interesting one of the things I was thinking about when I was listening to this is like how much of liberal morality is the, is the politics of the ego when it fails, it flips to a super ego for like 30 seconds. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I, think, that, I think that what is apparent is that science itself will come to conclusions different than those implanted in people basically. Right. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's fine because I think that, uh, human governance is not about just doing what science says in in many cases, and in fact, in most cases, probably. Uh, but if you're basing your entire political view on being objectively correct, then that's a big problem for you. And it leads to either attempts to change science or to uh, ignore it temporarily and, and, you know, upend what you think of as your governing consensus or upend democracy, uh, which will result in decisions that are antithetical to, you know, the established scientific result quite frequently. So what's interesting is that leads us to our next transition. Uh, and this transition, he associates with the new left. And I'm going to say, I think he's kind of correct on that. But at this point, there are now... This is universal. Just, yeah, it's not just... Leftists and even liberals, it's like you're going to find 
and not just even conservatives, you're going to find micro niche kinds of conservatives that now have this politics. Um, so basically he talks, basically one of the things he's positing is like, you know, for both their inherent flaws, that there's a, there's kind of a coherent or an attempt at a coherent, but self undermining sense of self. Now, you know, in him, the party of the super ego is going to become more and more repressive. It can't posit positive virtues. It's going to be more and more given to what we now call the negative partisanship. It's going to be a debased super ego of a hyper repressive order. You know, it's going to tendency towards what in Fordism would be classically called neurosis. Um, the part of the ego is in the effort to make moral consensus based around science, going to eliminate the idea of moral consensus at all and become purely scientific serving uh, and make all of these systems that people can't actually navigate on the basis of incentive. Right. And, and, and weirdly, it's going to make a less equal society. that won't It's going to make a society that. where the ego is less helpful. Right. Well, <laughs> but also interestingly... A society where, um, despite, I think you can see in this where Michael Sandel is going with the tyranny of merit. I mean, the thing with Sandel, Sandel actually still believes that maybe, you know, meritocracy is possible and good. And Blash would probably laugh at that. But, you know, I think Sandel thinks. That if you had meritocracy that didn't assume a neutral administrative state, that maybe it could. But then I, I point out now, I'm like, well, yeah, but now liberals don't justify themselves in neutral competence anymore. Not really. They justify themselves in moral competence. Um, that's which is, of course, going to hyper partisanize things. But that's that's to me, that's out of a failure. Like they can't they actually can't. They're going to scientifize everything, but it actually can't produce what they think it want, what they think they want, which is a neutral society. That's not possible. Right. Um, you can't like you can't actually fix all questions. Uh, objectively. Weird. I mean, like, you know. And I think, you know, the ultimate personification of this to me, that this tendency, though, is fucking Sam Harris. Like, and again, the line between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson is a thin line, but it, like, COVID made it clear where it was, right? And you can kind of see this, like you see this, uh, like therapeutic trying to trying to build a myth that turns into a super ego, kind of, but not, but it, it's immediately debased, like. Because it can't positive positive values, all it can do is run off fear. And even in Peterson, like it's the fear of chaos. Like it, Peterson can't really posit a vision of the good life on its own. It's got to be the vision of a good life. And maybe all moral claims are against this, but it seems particular now that like we we're not even arguing that this is good enough to be a good life. It's like, no, this is a noble battle against utter corruption. And maybe that's a trans historical tendency. I don't know. Um, but let's talk about chat. The last category gets its own chapter. So yeah. uh, the He's ideological smart. assault on the ego, um, which he said, which he sees as actually occurring out of a material source which I think people need to like remember, he's still kind of a materialist. And that ma the material source is a mixture of the wealth after World War II, but the political exhaustion of the ideologies before World War II. And the state just kind of existing, like and getting bigger and bigger, but with no real ideological drive. Um, and so where does the ideology come from now? You know, am I, am I like summarizing that base impulse yeah i mean he's he's saying that uh I, I thought this was kind of stupid because he like was like world war ii really like shocked people they were like how could modernity do this and i was like what about world war one I? I mean you know there's a lot of different things but the difference is that i think you hit the nail on the head following world war ii there's an exhaustion with ideology itself 
there's a feeling that politics has to turn towards questions of administration and management. Uh, and World War One really brings about ideology the way we think about it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the that's the reason. So I said that, and then I like had a comment like much later. I was like, okay, I'll give him some credit for this one. Um, the but anyway, you know, the following the, the war, there's a retreat from world conscious people into family life, um, the silent gen lifestyle. Right. I mean, it's literally, and what they literally design society to, like, if to you want to talk about this in, in a social reproduction sense, they actively design society to accommodate that retreat into the like, family. We are going to do atomization, folks. Like, um, yeah, and we're yeah, literally, the world, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and I think that actually what was great about this, which you were, you were pointing to, is that by writing that the new vision of, you know, the party of Narcissus originates in this experience, the experience of being either parents in this situation or children in this situation, uh, it says that the, the attempt to combine the personal with the political is actually incredibly tied up to childhood, basically. Um, which is why it's so fitting that so much of the discussion later is about attempts to, you know, basically in the vision of the party of Narcissus, make much of adult life more like childhood in some ways at, which, you know, at a basic level. Which, by the way, I think it's not only true, and I think there's scientific evidence for this, like the extension of adolescence all the way up into your third. And I'm going to say this as a person who literally has role playing posters in my background. Um, but the extension of adolescence all the way up until your middle 20s. I mean, I was looking at millennial statistics and there's a huge difference. And I'm in, I'm in that transitional period, but I did work in high school. The people just slightly younger than me, that was rare. And today that's that's becoming more common. But for about 10 years, it was unheard of. Yeah. Um, and there is an extension of credentialization. And I'm not saying this as a conspiracy. I think this is a systemic thing. I don't think anyone planned this. Uh, but credentialization was a way to control the labor market. As, a, as you got flooded with applications, there were more and more people and a relatively small amount of, of jobs that were decent. You started throwing up credential walls, which is part of my problem with the with the like most vulgar forms of the PMC thesis because they're like education. I'm like, yeah, education opens up jobs that you used to not have to have an education to get. Like, um, you could become an actuary with a high school education 60 years ago. You you need a graduate school degree for that now. Yeah. Like, and that may be reversing, and we're seeing signs that between not wanting uh immigration yeah. and Permitting child labor now. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, and it's not going to work either. I mean, there's not, yeah. uh, but, but there's a reason why it's happening where it's happening too. But I, I think, what I think here is like Lash actually, kind of gets some of that about why, like in Lash, sometimes he's saying, I mean, he's saying that following World War II, there was a political response that changed the, sh the the economic and social environment and implanted in people a new sense of what politics should do. Right. That's pretty, that's pretty materialist um, to me. And yeah. it also, like if you extend it further, explains a lot of the underlying elements of this. So he's writing all of this in response to like the 1980s and the 1970s and the collapse of like the New Deal consensus. Yeah, I'm going to read... I'm going to do something that we probably shouldn't do on podcasts where we're interviewing. I'm just going to read a big chunk of this. Go for it. I think it's helpful. From, the point, from this point of view, the radicalism of the 60s represented not so much a return to political commitments after a period of political retreat as a metamorphosis of personal life into politics. Make love, not war, the characteristic feature of the new left derived from the attempt to combine the personal with the political as, uh, as Firestone. Firestone, I can't say her first name either, noted in the 1970s and from its belief that the old uh, leafletting and pamphleteering and the Marxist analysis are no longer where it's at, the new left suspicion of large-scale social organization its rejection of democratic centralism its to trust of, of leadership and party discipline 
it's faith in small groups, it's reputation, it's uh, repudiation of power and power trips, work discipline, goal directed activity in general, it's repudiation of linear thinking. These attitudes, the source of so much that was fruitful in the new left and of so much that was futile and self defeating as well, originated in the contention, as the San Francisco Red Stockings put it in their 1970s manifesto, that our politics begins with our feelings. What I find interesting, even about contemporary complaints about the new left, uh, one, I have to admit that conflating hippies and the new left is a problem, right? Uh, that was always kind of an illusion. And I actually don't think Lash does it, but I do think we do. But in doing and realizing that's a problem, a lot of us overcorrect and start pretending like all the new leftists were somehow like, like that malice it, that you read about in uh, uh, Joan Didion, like, which is just not true. Like, they're basically Democrats. They're the people who are in charge now. And a lot of them start off as Marxists, but they de they they deviate really fast. Like, um, they're like Nancy Pelosi, right? Nancy Pelosi, uh, Gene Kwan, Mayor of Oakland. Uh, Jim Kwan Mayor of Oakland was like part of a very radical Maoist group. I mean, uh, Bill Ayers, like Bill Ayers being kind of a a figure for Obama to me is not an accident. Like, and I don't mean that in the way conservatives mean it. Like, it is actually a passing of the torch of a certain kind of politics to its obvious child in a way that isn't immediately obvious. Um, because what is what is Obama's selling point? Himself. He has no ideological selling point. Not really. Like, what do we what, what do we talk about uh, uh, Obama's virtues? Well, he's a very smart man who can adjudicate. Like, he's, he's a brilliant speaker. He's a brilliant yeah, speaker. Like he has no ideological. There's no ideological trace that comes from him. Like, there's not an Obama Democrat weirdly and the attempt to make one which were the kamala harris's and Lori lightfoot's of the world which is to find the right demographic cipher largely didn't work because they don't some of it's sexism i'm not gonna lie but a lot of it's also they don't have his gravitas yeah and no, he, he's got he's got pizzazz like mm -hmm. um i mean interesting trump is the same way you have in the collapse of neoconservatism Paleoconservatives have won, kind of, but not really. It's it's actually now, basically, I would say what you have now is a cult of the institution versus a cult of the individual, but both ended up being manifest in the way people view individual personalities. Yeah. Like, which is funny because we feel like we're in an ideological age. Well, I think we are, but I think that the... Uh... I don't well I don't think we're in an ideological age but I think we're we're in a polarized age around our politics begin with our feelings. Right, w which means that we feel intensely that there's political differences. I, I don't mean to be super cynical and and uh you and I probably disagreed with this more in the beginning although I know and it's not because of my influence I think you separately have come to some of the similar conclusions. That there is not actually that big of a break between Trump politics and Biden politics and policy. No, I, I don't think that. I, I think that they're they're substantively very similar, but in appearance very different. Right. Um, so I think there is a huge break in terms of cultural politics, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to be I want to be very clear about that. But in terms of the overall like structure of political economy that they're advocating, it's basically the same thing. But it's interesting that the cultural politics is different as they are. And I agree with you. They're, 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 they're worlds apart. They don't really affect policy that much except in the rear guard, which is the courts. Yeah. And, it's, you know, some administration rulings. Um, but the courts, of course, are like <laughs> super, as we've, we've seen recently, incredibly significant. Um, oh, yeah. I, well, particularly but, when, when no one wants to force a constitutional uh crisis that's going to happen anyway like let, yeah they've made their ruling let them enforce it there's yeah. a section that i'm looking for uh which talks about how like questions of economic distribution have like eliminated i think that's in the liberal uh section 
-hmm. where it's like the questions are no longer about political or economic power. They're about management and therapy or something like that. Right. Which I think he's, which I think what I think is interesting about the current moment is for a second, it looked like the, the left wing of the democratic party and people outside of the democratic who got brought back in, um, looked like they were going to refocus that. Um, but the, but interestingly, if you look at the movements, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I'm just going to say it. The move, the hashtag movements of the aught teens, they start with Occupy, which is largely an economic where gender and race are important. They're considered part, but it's an economic revolt. Um, it's a revolt about not enough stuff changing with Obama. Obama compromised too much with the bankers. They, they've, they've solidified the Democrats as, as kind of the liberal wing, the liberal therapeutic ring with neoliberalism. As it's dying, ironically, but nonetheless, right? Um, then you get Black Lives Matter, which I do think has, you know, a strong material and economic component tied to race. Uh, then you get, then you get the Me Too, which is, which is a uh, more I mean, professional. It's material in, within the professions. Yeah, it's material within professions. It absolutely matters. This is not me saying these are just cultural questions. But what is clear is you start with the reassertion of the economic. Then actually, it seems like we went back through the understandings of the politics of the 90s because they also hadn't been resolved. Like, this is not this is not me saying it's some kind of cultural regret. Well, none of these have been resolved, apparently, because he's talking about them in 1984. <laughs> right. Well, the, the thing is, like, all these questions that emerge at the end of the civil rights movements, even the even though we no longer talk about them in the terms of the baby boomers as they're dying off, none of them were resolved. Like, and so in the aught teens, I felt like we went through all of them and then ended up, we're talking about the most personal thing there is, which is sexual identity and gender identity. Right? Which, again, is in a social context. And again, it's an unsolved question. And this is not me belittling it. We're but not saying this is unimportant. We're no, saying it's... that this is a focus on a particular set of important issues among and right. and and a, not a focus on a set of much broader issues which are less personal ultimately which i find interesting because the reason why we have to focus on these issues is recuperation and counterattack so this stuff gets recuperated into the therapeutic liberalism but then whatever the fuck we're going to Talk, we have to talk about the right because, th like, I don't think Lash foresees exactly what kind of right was going to come. Um, but the Q right, yeah, the QP. Like, what's interesting is I think the fact that it it comes out of a degenerated liberalism in a lot of cases. The, like, I take seriously that a lot of these people were true Obama voters and shit like 12 years ago i really i don't think that's that's fake in a lot of cases i mean i i think that i think that most of the people who voted trump were mccain voters but the most interesting elements are the people who were uh you know mccain romney voters and then became committed partisan democrats and then people who were voted for obama twice and became committed mm -hmm. like trumpers yeah and the like, most fascinating cases right i, I think ultimately like we make too much out of the out of the marginal cases, but it is in QAnon it's telling because QAnon is actually where you find a lot of the people who just like. Also, seventeen percent of the population believes in it now. Apparently, wow, yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, not really marginal. I mean, I was walking around like Midtown the other day. And there's like a guy with like a queue where we go one, we go all shirt. Uh, you know, it's like pretty normal now, um, even in New York. All right. Well, that's, but what's interesting is that is also what I think is we're going to find when, when we talk about this is QAnon actually fits the, this description of the new left. Perfectly. Uh, 
like like in a very bizarre way. I'm gonna continue Perfect. reading. Uh, this is this is just the from the politics community feeling. Such politics can take many forms: radical feminism, environmentalism, pacifism, nihilism, a cult of revolutionary violence. Cultural revolution is an ambiguous slogan. In China, it involved it was invoked on behalf of systemic attacks on on intelligence and learning. A revolution against culture. Let's be specific, though. It was, I think that's unfair. But in China, it was actually tax on institutionalized hierarchical learning of a Confucian mode. Like it was not just against learning as such. In fact, they actually increased schooling during the time period. Hmm. Like, um, and the Ding reforms end. Like one of the things Dung do, does, what if he completely marketizes schools and doesn't pay for like rural women to get educated? That's a that's a that's a shift in policy, which it's amazing to me that like when I hear like both liberals and modern communists who sing Dung's praises like not listen to Chinese people say about what he actually did. Um, but anyway, in the West, a critique of instrumental reason has sometimes degenerated into a Dionysian celebration of irrationality. <coughs> Cough, cough, Makuza, cough, cough. Uh, Frankfurt School, cough, cough. This this book is like almost a direct, straightforward attack on the Frankfurt he's School. So, he's so mad at Marcuse. He's so mad at Marcuse. Um, I think almost unfairly mad at Marcuse too. Yeah, he's really, really mean to him, especially like he has one paragraph. He's like, to be fair, I've taken, you know, as the basis for my own politics – this entire book and 90% of it. And I think it's fascinating. I'm going to fixate now on like, you know, one thing that Marcuse gets wrong consistently to discredit him. Like I, you know, um, anyway. Um, the revolt against technological domination ports towards new forms of community, but also towards nihilism and adult subjectivity as Lewis Mumford called it. I think that's interesting. Cause this is, this is something that I think people didn't see. The incorporation of Heideggerian and Nietzschean ethic, uh, elements of authenticity into the right actually also inculcates them this way. But in this time period, weirdly, Heidegger and Nietzsche are more associated with the left. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting about that is because Heidegger and Nietzsche are actually all about you know, self-manifestation, will to power, et cetera, which, which I, it's actually in some ways, I find it interesting that Lash doesn't really deal well with that. Like that's out of his conceptions. Uh, and I think maybe because the American right wasn't there yet. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think it was apparent that it would be a problem. Um, like, you know, he's, he's much more concerned with like, the expression of like violence on the everyday um, right. and people giving into their base desires. He wasn't like yet concerned with people who were like, uh, there were no rules, you know, like, you know what I mean? I, I guess that's a horrible way to put it, but let's continue for that reason. Yeah. So <laughs> he talks about the Neo Freudian left and, you know, he talks about uh, uh, Wilhelm Reich and Eric Fromm. Uh, then Karen Horney and, and uh, Gregory Zilberg, who I've never heard of. He's uh, saying that all of the neo-Freudian left is bad. Uh, and yeah. he's talking with the neo-Freudians here prior to the new left, uh, right. to be clear, uh, because he's saying that they're liberal. Um, Although, I mean, I think that's interesting to accuse uh, Eric Fromm and William Reich of being liberal. but um... Or he's saying <laughs> that the result of their their conception of psychoanalysis is to make it just like the same thing as the liberal yeah. reading of psychoanalysis, except in the pursuit of different social goals. Right. Uh, um, and then it's to Marcuse, Brown, and the feminists. And these are like the three positions he examines. So let's uh, talk about Marcuse and surplus repression. So Marcuse is approaching Freud in the same way Marx approaches David Ricardo, Lash writes. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's not, you know, so he's not, un, you know, unambiguously in favor of Freud. He's trying to dig through it and make it Marxist. Um, and Marcuse is attempting to historicize Freud. Uh, he's saying that 
there's a theory of civilization from Freud that derives the need for repression from the natural disproportion between human desires and the demands of reality. Um, he's saying Freud said that. Uh, but Marcuse is trying to say that um, you don't have repression in existing, but in when existence is organized oppressively. So basically the goal of this project is to say that repression is necessary to maintain patriarchal society, capitalist society, but is not necessary in and of itself, um, which is something shared by all three of these positions. So that's, that's like a, a root thing. Marcuse, uh, Lash says, is, is not really good at this or fails to uh, meet the demands of you know, what he's selected to embark on because he falls back on the theory of the primal horde. Uh, the primal horde is basically like there's at the beginning of civilization, civilization starts because there's a rebellion against a father who monopolizes all the women by all the sons, they eat him. It's not really important. The point is that it's, it's just like- It's important if you're a Lacanian, but- it's or... the, What's important for this is that it's conjecture and it's not historical analysis. Right. Um, whereas for Marx, like, all of Marx's analysis of surplus uh, originated in like a real thoroughgoing critique of political economy as it existed in his day. Um, and Lash says that this in, in the case of uh, Marcuse is especially detrimental uh, because Marcuse noticed, um, and, and this is something that Lash takes from him, the sort of obsolescence of the traditional form of paternalism. Um, and that in the case of fascism and Stalinism, the vision of father was very substantively altered from what it traditionally was. And the emergence uh, in all of modern society was a quote, you know, society without fathers. Um, and as a result, uh, Lash says that um, the idea from uh, Marcuse that the Freudian, you know, concept of man relies on the primal horde and there's a basic repression that comes from paternalism, which continues all throughout the modern world. Obviously, if paternalism no longer exists and repression still exists, repression cannot be rooted in paternalism. Uh, I think this is a pretty it's a good overview. And then the, the goal from this is that Marcuse says, okay, the only way we can make a non-repressive society is to have play, to not believe in work at all because it's paternalistic. But uh, Marcuse says that the way in which you're going to have like a purely pleasure organized society is you need to accelerate technology and have a vast industrial army first. Um, which I think uh, Lash misses that he's that uh, Marcuse is flipping Heidegger on his head. Yeah, um, like, like it, it's it's a Heideggerian anti Heideggerianism in Marcuse, which is actually unique to him in the Frankfurt School. Uh, which is, I think, why he becomes you know the philosopher of play, as opposed to say overly literal readings of the dialectic of enlightenment, like say John Saracen, which is like, we have to get rid of reification. Let's get rid of all civilization altogether, uh, which is also weirdly something that uh, Heidegger plays around with a little bit, but um, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think he's right about that. I just think this is where him, him viewing this mostly through a Freudian lens causes him to miss some things mm -hmm. and understanding what's going on. In Marcuse, because there's other elements at play there. Definitely. Uh, but I, I actually kind of agree with with uh, the inviability of because basically what Marcuse is advocating is gay luxury space communism. Yeah, I was going to say that, but I like, wanted to get to it, <laughs> which is, which is frankly impossible. And it would suck. I mean, like, <laughs> I want to do stuff, you know? Right. Um, um, yeah. I mean, and. And I also think, like, that's not how technology, like, the, like there's no. there's a material element on the limits of technology, a physicalist element of the limits of technology. Like, 
all of our internet actually requires vast physical infrastructure and huge amounts of power um that that like Marcuse just doesn't deal with um and i think a lot of the proponents of gay luxury space communism also don't deal with they only look at technology ironically from its individualistic consumer end and i i think that they're also like not really in, in vogue like let's be let's be no fair. they were in vogue it's, six years ago yeah and now it's like this is passe uh, like we don't talk about left accelerationists anymore they're stupid we moved on or like, if, you know the the left accelerationists we do talk about are like they have the much, evil ones that like, well they, <laughs> i'm gonna say they have curtailed their ambitions um it's like we're going to do left accelerationism where we have like a lot of nuclear power and things are cheap. Like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Early... They're social democrats. We're no longer, we're no longer trying to do Aaron Bostani style. No, wow. they're like, we will have cheap housing. We will have cheap energy. Like, you know, it's, it's a renunciation of a lot of the elements of this, which are utopia. Uh, which actually just makes it boring ass liberalism. Which is the irony. Hey, look, everybody's a liberal now. Um, except for me. Except for you. Um, we should call you the last Marxist farm. Uh, Gene Bajalon <laughs> likes to joke that I'm the only real platypus. <laughs> like, like, because I, I reject, I reject their tendency to see Bonapartism as a, as an interest way to deal with the crisis of the left, because I think it's a lack of imagination on their part. Mm. And, uh, which, I, uh, which I know, I know I'm going to anger, or, or they'll tell me I don't understand it. Motherfucker, I, I have the two books in the back and I was in the group. I was in there for several years. Um, although that part of their thought was not part of their thought when I was in there. There was no, there was not nearly the interest in Bonapartism there is now. This brings us to Brown. I find, and by Brown, for those of you who are used to modern theorists, he means Norman O'Brown, not Wendy Brown. Um, just to be clear, because I had to remind myself this was Norman O'Brown because he like doesn't use his his name. He just referred them as Brown. I'm like, motherfucker, there's a lot of Brown slash even at the time you're writing. That's um, almost like kind of epic. People should like do that more where they're just like <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> um, I had to like I had to look in the back of the book uh, when I was reading this. I'm like, I think he's talking about Norman O'Brown. Yes, he's talking about Norman O'Brown, but you have to look at the index to like clarify. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, the the pathology of purpose of, of, pur of purposefulness. I think Brown is interesting. Brown's great. Um, and and I think what's interesting about this is, uh, even though uh, Lash likes like say ninety percent of Marcuse and but hates the ten percent so much that's the only thing he focuses on. Um, you get the feeling that he has slightly more respect for Brown. Also, ninety eight percent with Brown. Yeah, uh, and then he's like, but he he doesn't get the the conclusion. So Brown is. Uh, like Marcuse, he's condemning purposeful activity as a substitute for deeper gratifications. And he's more mm -hmm. consistent, Lash, Lash says, because he's not advocating for luxury, you know, gay, fully automated space communism. Right. Um, so Brown roots uh, conflict and repression in separation anxiety, not the Oedipal complex, and mm -hmm. ultimately in the fear of death. Uh, for Marcuse, there's... Uh, you know, repressive modification because there's not enough like resources um, for painless gratification. For Brown, the reason why there's repression and lack of resources is not the social organization of production, but that there's urgent instinctual demands, which like obviously cannot ever always be met precisely at the moment. Uh, so Brown is saying that repression of instinctual desires is way more necessary and common than Marcuse says. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case it's of Brown... It's not just a dialectic of enlightenment. It's actually like fundamental to humans. For it's actually fundamental to human nature in separation anxiety, um, which contaminates the, quote, narcissistic project of loving union with the world with the unreal project of becoming oneself, oneself, one's whole world.
Um, it, you know, so basically for Brown, it's all separation anxiety, which is the same thing for Lash. Uh, and in, in Brown's case, the fantasy is absolute self-sufficiency, i.e. narcissism, which is what Lash also reads the fantasy as. Um, and Lash is like, in response to this, Brown's reading of Freud is superior to Marcuse's in several respects. So it ends that sexual pleasure is the only object of repression. Uh, it suggests that neuroses uh, is deeper than just like a conflict between pleasure and the patriarchal work ethic. Uh, and it says that those ideas are very dependent on ideas of historical progress. Uh, and, you know, basically Brown pierces through a lot of the worst elements of the neo-Freudians and also pierces through some of the worst elements of Marcuse. But, but then introduces his own bad element. His own bad element. And in this case, the bad element is the fact that Marcuse needs to arrive at a particular set of conclusions. You mean Brown? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Brown. Uh, so the conclusions are that psychoanalysis will result in something good uh, and will you know, be used to transform itself into social criticism and change human culture. And when he says change human culture, because you might think, well, isn't this Lash's project? Do social criticism and change human culture. Uh, he, you know, he means solve human culture, solve conflict in Brown's eyes, mm -hmm. um, or solve fundamental conflicts uh, that Freud says are impossible to solve through psychoanalysis. Uh, the way Brown recovers this optimism, as Lash calls it, is the hypothesis of a death instinct where he redefines existence, which he said requires repression to, to you know, have its opposite as death, a state of absolute rest. Um, and he says that it's viable to have a situation in which you have activity, which is also at rest. And for him, that's play. Um, he has a very odd definition of play, though, that he says play is pure desire, unrepressed and unsublimated uh, and ignores, in Lash's words, that it originates in the search for a mother substitute, tries to recapture the lost nirvana of infancy and reconciles us to its loss by enabling us to assert our growing mastery over our surroundings. So in this case, Brown needs to arrive at a conclusion that mastery over the surroundings is bad and... Uh, that, you know, repression is also bad uh, and that you can have a situation where you're perfectly unrepressed right. through play. So one of the things I find fascinating as a person who's come up now where all this French psychoanalysis has replaced this, but it's actually done the same shit. Like a rigor ray actually recapitulates in a much more obscure fashion some of the arguments of Firestone and, and Horny whose name is unfortunate that's karen horny um but uh it's interesting because lash ignores marxist feminism the, the, i will say one of the things i get frustrated in this part of the book is lash is being selective yeah. like um and i think he's accurate to the dominant theories of the day as opposed to what we normally see one of the things that we've done now is the Frenchification of... Of everything. Yeah, uh, you know, we, but we, we tend to see the new left in terms of its French manifestation in May 68. And that's not our new left. Like, that's not our new left. Like, and I think... I partially think it's because the current left actually in some deep way actually is embarrassed when this stuff is comprehensible. And thus they prefer the French version because the French version is less comprehensible, partly because of our weird translations of French terms, which themselves are necessitated. I actually pointed, someone pointed this out to me and it, like all of a sudden a whole lot of clicked. I'm like, oh, some of this academic terrorism is because you have to make up new words in French. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I think also like I've I've not read, uh, what's that like Guy Debord, Debord book? The spectacle thingy the society 
spectacle and uh and then the remarks in society spectacle i watched the movie and i'm sorry it was terrible like i just have to say it like i'm so thankful that our new left even though people are now embarrassed about it was at least comprehensible uh sorry i'm not gonna i'm not gonna get into dissing guy de board i um, am i i, I uh it? I, I've actually said the spectacle is one of the most poorly and under theorized things that's ever been thrown around. Yeah, and, and Lash uses it in Culture of Narcissism a little bit. Yo, know, he even uh, references the board in Culture of Narcissism. But... Yeah, he does. But he like kind of redefines it to be like very narrowly like there's a lot of advertising images and politics is becoming that way. Which yeah. like <laughs> is I mean he turn he he like limits it it to like marshall McLuhan as opposed to like <laughs> yeah get board where it's everything yeah and it's kind of like i've been arguing with baudrillardians who get mad at me when i take baudrillard at face value for what he fucking says um and they're like but he i'm like no but he literally said there's no, like you might go oh we need context and yes the context is helpful but in some ways i think you guys are contextualizing your way out of what he said like you're trying to make it more complicated than the text, I believe even in French, actually is. Like, and make him have more of an argument than he actually posits. Like you are fixing the absent argument through what I would actually consider uh ad hoc contextualization. The movie not, is like it's like like ambient noise, basically. Well, but yeah, I mean the society is spectacle. An ambient society. What what are the things about the about the situationists in the letter as to precede them is it's it's Dada rebranded as communist, mm -hmm. which doesn't really make that much sense. Yeah. Um, like, uh, anyway, they're, they're not our new left. No, they're not our, our new left. left. Like Tom Hayden, like stuff like that. SD. Uh, yeah. Uh, Norman Brown, the Frankfurt school, which is German, but like exists here. Um, particularly Marcuse, who's the one who stays. So I think, and I think the idea that like the working class have become, had internalized capital and have become repressive itself is, is very much that is in the American new left. Um, that's, it's not universal. And in fact, it, I would say one of the things that Lash unfairly doesn't deal with is in the seventies, how many people tried to undo that trend and mm -hmm. they just couldn't. Like it failed over and over and over again, but people were trying. Like, okay, we got to go back into the factories. We got like he mentions it offhand, but he doesn't really deal. He with talks it. about it some in World of Nations, but he's like, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he talks about that actually in World of Nations and Agony of the American Left. But like, when he actually is writing about the New Left later, then he like in... doesn't give them credit for the things that they tried. He talks right. about the academics. Yeah, he talks um, solely about the academics, which I think is. I think one of the things that the problem that you have with Lash is through the course of his life, he moves from social history to academic debate. And I think that's just the nature of his job. Yeah. But though he moves back to social history. In, yeah. Later. Uh, yeah. Uh, right after this. Um, and true and only heaven. But, um, but even then his, his social history is more of figures where, whereas his social history and the essays that make up the agony of the American left, uh, world of nations and, uh, new radicals, new radicals is his figures, but agony of the American left and world of nations is not really about fi individual yeah, it's, figures. It's, it's about, about every it's essay. About movements. It's about, uh, anyway, let's, let's yeah. get back to, uh, let's get back into this. This we, is a more intellectually interesting, yeah, but more frustrating. We went off, off on this tangent when talking about our new left and how Lash doesn't give them enough credit. Well, uh, well also are... that Lash sees them in the, in the context of their Freudian mm -hmm. uh, manifestation. But I find it interesting. What I was pointing out, though, that really began this tangent, is in the 90s, we have the new left come back, but it's Frankified, so you don't recognize it. It's actually less comprehensible. So, like... I've come to respect that, like, Lacanianism actually isn't that different from... It's different, but it's not that different from other forms of psychoanalysis. Um, but it's phrased incomprehensibly on purpose. Like, um, and, and even people 
like, you know, I've talked to my Brazilian psychoanalytic friends and they just admit it now. I was like, yeah, some of this is not comprehensible. And that's kind of the point. I'm like, so you missed it. So you re-mystified the new left. So when it was reintroduced, you wouldn't recognize it. Like that seems to have been an academic product uh, project of the late eighties or nineteen uh, nineties. Yeah. Like, cause that's what my teachers were coming out of. And I'm so think, I'm trying to think if that was my experience. Uh, I think it was done by your, by, by the time you were a kid. Yeah. I mean, we, we're like, uh, like the, new, the millennial left, which is also the Gen Z left. If for those of us who are like old enough to, you know, read. Um, yeah, you're you're millennial nihilist, but you still have basically the same left that we do. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and then also like the the new. It was not really like a new left style movement. It was very focused on politics, very focused on economics, uh, and then the cultural stuff was like kind of like the last gasp of loss, you know, of of defeat. Well, uh, to me, it was like actually a return to the norm. That's the that's the weird thing because that's for most of my life. What we experiencing right now is the norm of left politics. Oh, well, that's something to look forward to. Yeah, uh, it sucks. Anyway, I think actually one thing we started off on this huge tangent is that Lash is not reading feminists and giving them enough credit. Yeah, I was about to say that, that we're about to get to the, to the section of Freudian feminism. He seems to like Firestone, but doesn't really deal with her very much actually in this section, which is weird. Uh, you will notice that. Marcuse and Brown are just one figure. All Freudian feminists are lumped together. Now, I, I also will point out that, with the exception of Firestone, uh, these people aren't read anymore, for the most part. And I get maybe they are in like very specific psychoanalytic schools. I think Stephanie Engel is. Yeah, yeah, that one I've still. I think I have some stuff. And he spends the longest amount of time talking about. Well, like Karen Honey and Clara Thompson, I had to go look them up when I read this the first time. If like, because I'm like, I've never heard of these people. Yeah. Like, I'd only heard of Firestone, and and then, uh, Engel, and uh, Dinnerstein and Ch uh, and Chodorov, 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 Nancy. Uh, Chodaro, Chodoro, I don't know. Um, I have seen in print, meaning that I've read other books where they have referenced, but I have not read them and I wasn't taught them. I was taught, uh, this is what brought it up. I was taught a rigore. I was taught um, uh, Butler. I was taught Wendy Brown, even that she was new when I was in school. Um, uh, and then we went back to Firestone a little bit. Um, we didn't talk about any of these Freudian feminists who weren't Lacanian Freudian feminists, um, which I found interesting. Like, like I was taught Brown. I was definitely fucking taught Marcuse, but like this, I was not taught. Yeah. Um. So let's. What's his critique of Freudian feminism? So his critique is basically that they ascribe things to the masculine that are just universal. Um, so he has a couple of critiques, one of which is very good, the other of which strikes me as like a little goofy. Yeah, the first um, one I found, I actually found compelling, the idea that like there's an essentialization of masculinity that's actually more universal character traits that you can find in all kinds of people. That's actually the one I found as less compelling because I oh. thought he was literalizing what they were talking as metaphorical. And I thought he wasn't giving them credit for that. But I also, I mean, I think it's, I think it's accurate. I just think it's like kind of semantic harping. Well, but the thing is, maybe he takes Freudian gender psychology stuff literally. Yeah, that's the like, thing. That's like, like, that's not just true for his reading of feminists. That's true across right. the board. Like, that was one of the things which Daniel Tutt was pointing out to me where Lash is actually, a lot of ways Lash is really progressive, but he says, but unlike the French school who reads... Uh, masculine and feminine principles as symbolic of like agency roles. And so anyone can be anything. Um, you also have to remember that for Freud, like a lot of his stuff, he just like, you know, like he'll talk, he'll say in like a letter to a friend, like, yeah, you know, this concept, I meet it up in a bath on a Sunday morning. That's actually true. That's how he came up with the prime, the theory of the primal horde. 
I know that because I've read it today uh, in preparation for this. But anyway, well, uh, I mean, when you when you go back and read Freud, there is like you're just picking from myths and like universalizing them, which in a way, then when I realized that I was like, Oh, no wonder Jung did it. Yeah. I actually, I love Freud, but he's so goofy. It's so nice. Um, right. But the other thing, the other argument that Lash makes about this is that the goal of the feminist project, as he sees it here, is to have a uh, solipsis, solipsis, Tick. whoa uh, side of narcissism where they're unifying with nature they're you know asserting their dependence on nature and, and striving for unity and he sees this as basically the same uh project as the you know supposedly masculine conquest of technology and conquest of nature the goal in either case is an abolition of uh you know differentiation between the self and the world and an attempt to meet the equilibrium of the prenatal state, uh, and in both cases, uh, to regress rather than than you know growing up. Um, yeah, this is the this is in the section that he entitles the case for for narcissism, masculine enterprise against feminine mutuality, which he basically says like both of these things are false. They're actually yeah. basically the same thing. Yeah, and well, I mean, I think one thing he says uh, kind of implicitly which is tied to the thing that I said wasn't that compelling and you mm -hmm. said was compelling, uh, that there's feminine mutuality and masculine, whatever, uh, is he seems to suggest this is actually the society we already have. Like, this is not something new. Um, this is like just the result of the fact that you're operating in a society where people have separation anxiety where they like nature and they recognize that they're dependent on nature at the same time as they want to like conquer space, you know, um, he doesn't seem to think that there's anything new about the solution at the deepest level. Um, in, yeah. in some way. I think that's, so, uh, you know, I find the, I find the overly centralization of gender weird in uh it's 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 a it's because i encountered it also in a, a, a rigor ray like and a lot of the lacanian female at least a french lacanian female I, I, i'm beginning to dig into the slavine lacanian women which is another whole basket that i don't feel qualified to speak on um but there is, in which case, sometimes it's metaphorical and sometimes it's literal and it's easy. This is where I, like, get Elaine Sokol's frustration with them because, like, sometimes they're making metaphorical claims that seem like they're making empirical claims and they're based on, like, empirical science and then they deduce from the metaphor a structure that they posit as real. Um, and what I find interesting about that is that's actually less obscured in this. But this would be this would have been highly unpopular even when I was in school, like to talk about uh, feminine and masculine um, impulses this way. Like um, it would have been seen as gender essentializing. Um, so maybe that's my generational bias because I grew, I went through with even like Freudians mm -hmm. were not talking this way, and and thus I never know when neo Freudians are being literal or not. Um, and it, like, and the one thing I can say about the French case is they're almost never, but in the German English and American case, it's actually very hard to tell. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess I'm more sympathetic, but I also found that I found that whole like masculine enterprise and feminine mutuality to be like, yeah, that, like in so much those gender roles exist now, you're just expanding the implications of those gender roles to like a total is a totalizing degree. Yeah. You're saying like, you know, get in touch with your feelings or be a girl boss. Right. Like, um, and I just want to like clarify what the actual pitch is from the narcissists. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lash writes that Stephanie Engel says uh, that, um, the exclusive that that basically there's a, a goal to is to desire the desire is to reconcile ego and ego ideal 
The drive to return to the undifferentiated if infantile state of primary narcissism helps to provide the content and drive for the imagination as well as the emotions that are, that are at the heart of our creative life. Thus, an alternative to the Freudian model of emotional development is the insistence that neither agency of morality uh, should overpower the other. This challenge to the moral hegemony of the superego would not destroy its power, but would instead usher in a dual reign. Um, so that's the pitch. Uh, and it's not, you know, I, I think Lash's basic perception about all of this is this is a great diagnosis of a lot of the problems with the contemporary or the, the liberal and the, or sorry, the superego and the egos. Yeah. Which he does identify as liberal and conservative, although we're about to get to where he re-breaks that down. Yeah. So um, he says, this is a great diagnosis. They have horrible problems. Your solution does not work. Yeah. Your solution is like disillusionment of the self, our total, our total removal of boundaries, which would of course lead to narcissism. Yeah. And, you know, and like, you know, the worst kinds of narcissism, right? Psychic, you know, in terms of psychic desiccation. This is one of the things that I, I told you, like my, my reading of Lash is like, like his understanding of, of what we would be now, we're no longer in like the Fordist narcissistic, particularly the secondary narcissism of Fordism, where the narcissism is manifested through your identification of yourself with your work. Um, and not as part of a larger community, in which you differentiate yourself. But now he would almost, you know, I said total psychic devastation. I think you're actually more technically correct in total psychic desiccation. It's a flip from secondary narcissism in the kind of Freudian framework to primary narcissism. And that's um, what he's doing in this book. Because yeah. he, in the last one, he only talks about secondary. And it's why Culture of Narcissism is not as good of a book as Minimal Self, in my opinion. Yeah. It's also why it's easy to misread. It just also sounds for lack of a better phrasing to use the sexist word bitchier hmm. than, than minimal self. Cause minimal self is actually, uh, I find interesting. However, I'm going to get to the point where he sounds like Jordan Peterson. Um, <laughs> but we need to get there. I guess we got to do one more thing. Purposes of nature, nature and selfhood, the case of the guilty conscience. No, no, no. That's uh that's after the Jordan Peterson section. Oh, actually. is that, Wait, that's like the last eight pages of the uh, the book. Um, the Jordan Peterson section is like uh, the end of the the feminist section. Oh, well, there's also one at the end of the page, of the eight pages of the book. But oh, really? He has like a ton of them. But like with the one where like he like bemoans that we can't go back to Judeo Christian conceptions of self, and I'm like, oh, no, no, there's yes. no such thing as a Judeo Christian conception. It is right at the end. Um, oh, I, I love was... that section. Uh, but let me get to it. Um, yeah. the case, the yeah, let's get to the it's the end of the this is one of the few ones where I think some of the feminist complaints. I, I tend to actually be sympathetic to Lash's conception of feminism because when people say he didn't take it seriously, I'm like, no, he read a lot of it closely. Yeah, um, he's kind of. And I think in, in the book I'm reading by him now that I didn't read before because it's not chronological and so I didn't know where to fit it uh, is Woman in the Common Life. And now I'm looking at it and going, no, I see like he's all over the place on, on feminism, really. Yeah. Like, I mean, that is like a co collection from like the whole of his life also. Right. Right. Which, um, which is why it's all over the place. But like, I don't know. He's like... He never loses his admiration for like the most radical end of 19th century feminism, mm -hmm. which is yeah. kind of interesting. Like, yeah. cause he, he likes the radicals in the far past, but he doesn't like them now. Like uh, he kind of, he's always bemoaning that the, like the moderate conservative wing of, of feminism in the 19th century and early 20th century is the one it won. Yeah. Um, until until he gets to Freudian and feminism and then he's like, but maybe it could get worse. I don't know. Um, so he has his his solution to this. Oh, no. Yeah. First is the cybernetic section. Oh, God, we got to get to that. Yes. So that's the thought. That's the, the part I thought you were going to talk about. So anyway, well, let's get to that. Where is that in this? It's on uh, page uh, two hundred and fifty and fifty two. 
Okay. But anyway, that he oh, had... I was looking. I was looking directly out of it. It was a the purpose. Is that the purpose in that nature and self of critique? Yes, it's right is. above that. Yeah. Um. Let's let's get to this. The conception of. Um. Oh yeah, this is gonna make some Marxists mad. Actually, I'm gonna read this whole paragraph. According to Henry Malcolm, the cultural values of narcissism lies in the non-differentiation of the self from the world. You know, we've already talked about that. The appeal of these ideas lies in the seeming ability to address some of the most obviously important issues of the times. The arms race and the danger of nuclear war, the technological destruction of the environment, the limits of economic growth. As Barbara Gelpi contends, it has become urgently important, this is a quote, for the men in our patriarchal society to recognize the feminine within themselves before the untrampled combination of the masculine science and masculine and aggressiveness destroy us all. The metaphysical reconstruction advocated by F, uh, by E.F. Schumacher and other environmentalists appears to him on the cultivation of a new sense of oneness with nature and understanding, as Kai Curry Lindahl puts in the conservation for survival, that man is as dependent on nature as an unborn child is on its mother. In, in an essay entitled Penetheus Rebounded, uh, Gene Houston traces the environmental crisis to dualistic agony in man separate from nature. It's an enormous significance, she writes. The current crisis in consciousness occurs concomitantly with the ecological destruction of the planet by technological means. The need to reverse the, the to quote reverse the ecological plunder gives urgency and direction to the mounting dissatisfaction with consumerism and competitive individualism. Humanity's survival depends on the discovery of new forms of consciousness and fulfillment apart from the traditional sense of consumption, control, aggrandizement, and manipulation. The time has come to take off the psychological self, all dormant potentials that were not an, uh, immediately necessary to man as role as Promethean man over nature. The ecological consciousness, according to Robert Ditch, renounces the illusion of separateness and superiority over nature. It recognizes the need for universal symbiosis with the land, as Otto Leopold put it many years ago. And Gregory Bateson, another forerunner and prophet of the ecological society conceptions of selfhood, ha had to be replaced by understanding the way personal identity emerges uh, into all the processes of relationships in the vast ecology and aesthetic of, co of, of cosmic interaction. Oh my God. This stuff is comprehensible, but oh my God, is it Willie? Um, the concept of self based and maintained can no longer function as a nodal argument in the, in the pronunciation of experience, since we now understand, thanks to cybernetics, that the ecological system as a whole is more important than the individual organism that comprises it. Indeed, the unit of survival, either in ethics or in evolution, is not the organism or the species, but the entire environment which the organism depends. And I think people forget that ecology branched off from cybernetics, but shh, don't tell them. But the self is a false reification of an improperly delimited part of this much larger field of interlocking processes. Linear purpose of thinking ignores the interconnectedness characteristic of complex cybernetically integrated systems. So I was just going to point, stop here. I think it's interesting that when people go back to cybernetics, they go back to, to Wiener through about Stanford beer, and then they stop. And I think they stop, and, and there's all kinds of problems with Norbert Wiener. One is like he assumes all kinds of stuff off the servo mechanic effect that I think is not justifiable. And it is basically, um, he has a B.F. Skinner view of of the con uh, composition of self, which I don't think people realize because they don't read it, like the text he wrote with other people in the beginning. They only read like the human, the human use of human beings. Um, and don't realize the problem with assuming, for example, that the servo mechanic effect leads to consciousness. If there's any recursion, which I think, which I actually had an argument with somebody who was like, I think this limited learning stuff is going to lead to communists. I got this from Sabine. Uh, and I'm like, no, <laughs> like uh one thing we we i can tell you is we is right now given our understanding of neurology it does not appear that the neurological servo or motor effect uh, can explain consciousness unless consciousness is totally ad hoc um but anyway it exaggerates the importance of conscious control uh, excuse me blah 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 i skipped a lot okay the self is a reification blah 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 
Linear purpose of thinking ignores the interconnectedness characteristic of complex cybernetically integrated systems. It exaggerates the importance of conscious control as important towards the proper relations between thought and feeling upside down and thus replaces the id with the ego. Psychoanalysis in, Bas in Basin's view is a product of almost totally distorted epistemology and a totally distorted view of what sort of thing a man or any organism is. In common with varieties of scientific materialism, it overlooks a vast and integrated network of the mind. It amounts to a monstrous denial of the integration of the whole, which Lash finds to be like, like if you collapse self and whole, then there's really no meaning to either one of them. Yeah. Um, which I think is interesting. Uh, what, what I get from this period of cybernetics that he's writing about is why people started rejecting it as anti-human because it did start to posit that like, you know, we're not talking about the humane use of human beings as conscious agents is the way that everyone from Norbert Wiener to Stanford Beer is, even if they're also basing that consciousness off of behavioristic assumptions, um, some of which are highly problematic. And people were arguing me about it, but we can talk about that another day. It's not it's actually not even a provable case. Like, I don't know how you prove it. But um, when you get to Bates and you start seeing like, oh, they don't even think individuals are important anymore, nor is linear thinking important. Everything is systemic and systemic also needs to be reduced to uh, feeling our feelings about systems, which is interesting because it takes a it does collapse. I mean, his point here is the whole like like technological enterprise and cybernetic theory and mutuality totally collapses into one thing like um and it's and it's and it, it leads to like a uh, the de-identification of the individual with a self and into everything which is according to Lash, like the definition of narcissism mm -hmm. um okay so so that's why we moved from secondary to primary narcissist so we moved from uh, Fordism to neoliberalism, kind of, actually, weirdly. Um, although he wouldn't really make that conscious until 1988 when he writes about it in True and Only Heaven. Um, okay, so that leads us purposeful nature itself with the case for a guilty conscience, which I think is him... I think it's a really unsatisfying conclusion, but it's some beautiful writing. Yeah, I was going to say it's beautiful. I mean, I like... I like anytime someone sticks it to Jurgen Habermas. I like I get glee out of that. I mean, just for personal reasons. But uh, I find his, I find it interesting that Lash's answer to this is Reinhold Niebuhr, and Reinhold Niebuhr is Obama's favorite philosopher. And in some way, for me, this is this is not a rational argument. But somehow, for me, this proves that Lash is wrong about the answer. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. MLK also quite liked Reinhold Niebuhr. So, yeah. Well, I'm, and Ash likes MLK. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess I think, you know, my conclusion to this would be that Obama probably misread Niebuhr. Uh, no, I'm joking. I don't know. The reason I think that this is unsatisfying is because it lacks political content. <laughs> or yeah, uh, I, I, ironically, he's so aware of this problem and everybody else. And but he's not giving he's not giving a solution. He's saying like this is a set of cultural attitudes and psychological attitudes which would serve as the basis for a better politics. Right. But we don't have the means to bring him back, sorry. Which no. yeah. Which I find uh, you know, I my my friend Shallon Van Tine, who you know, who's co-writing this book with me, is always like, Well, you don't have to posit an answer to a question if the question's unanswerable. But to which I say he does try to posit an answer, it's just not an answer. It's just not an answer. I like, mean, I I have my own reading of this, which is that a lot of this is historical commentary and it's commentary on as a historian, the relationship with history of all of these different groups. Mm -hmm. And his attitude is like, basically, uh, well, the goal is the operation of a good, a good culture, which requires a healthy relationship with history, where you are both thankful for the past and you're like, we're not in the past. Uh, and you look towards the future. And at the same time, you don't want to change everything because you live in a culture uh, 
and you know yada 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 it's just basically like a centering of history in the process and you can see this on the, the last page what i find interesting about this is this is almost a quasi marxian burkean conservatism yeah like really it's like it's like we believe in Marx, but also institutions exist for a reason, and you know, like we should maintain them as a as a way to. But I'm gonna I'm gonna read the last three paragraphs because like, our, it's great writing. It's beautiful. But, but wow, um, both the champions and critics of the rational ego turn their backs on what remains valuable in the Western Judeo Christian tradition of individualism, as opposed to the tradition of acquisitive individualism, which parodies and subverts it. The definition of selfhood as tension, division, and conflict. As Niebuhr pointed out, attempts to ease an uneasy conscience takes the form of a denial of man's divided nature. Either the rational man or the natural man is conceived as essentially good. If the party of the ego glorifies the rational man, the party of Narcissus seeks to dissolve the tension in its own way by dreaming up a symbiotic reunion with nature. It glorifies the, nat uh, the natural man often after redefining nature itself, however, as an aspect of some universal mind. As for the party of the superego, it equates the conscience not with the awareness of the dialectical relationship between freedom and the capacity for destruction, but with the adherence to a received body of authoritative moral law. It hankers for the restoration of punitive sanctions against disobedience, above all for the restoration of fear. It forgets that conscience, as distinguished from the superego, originates not so much in the fear of God as the urge to make amends. Conscience arises not so much from the dread of reprisal by those we have injured or to wish to injure as capacity for mourning or remorse. In individuals, it is the development of significant... In the individuals, this development signifies the child's growing awareness that parents he wishes to punish and destroy are the same parents of whom he relies for love and nourishment. It represents the simultaneous acceptance of dependence on fathers, mothers, and natures and our inevitable separation from the primordial source of life. In the history of civilization, the emerging conscience can be linked, among other things, to the changing attitudes towards the dead. The idea that the dead call for revenge, that their avenging spirits haunt the living, and that the living know no peace until they placate the ancestral ghost gives way to an attitude of genuine mourning. At the same time, the dictated gods give way to gods who show mercy as well as uphold the morality of loving your enemy. Such a morality has never achieved anything like general popularity, but it lives on, even in our enlightened age, as a reminder of our fallen state and our surprising capacity for gratitude, remorse, and forgiveness, by means of which we now and then transcend it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Full of shit. Well, it's, it's <laughs> endless, yeah. Um, um, I was, this is when I'm like, there's a tendency in Lash that I, that I know after what I call the the early historical period of Lash, so we can argue about uh, Haven in a Heartless World, but definitely um, uh, liberals in the Russian Revolution, New Radicals, the Agony of American Left, and World of Nations are primarily historical texts. Like they're not theoretical texts in the way this is. They're not. They do attempt to construct things, but they tend to construct things in the understanding of the things themselves, right? Like. They're kind of imminent critiques of the left in terms of its own goals and own understandings and, and origins and eliminations of that. This moves away from that. Um, and what I find is he's so often right about the lack of materiality in these new leftists who claim to be materialists. But then at the end, he's like, well, you know, we need an integrated self and blah, 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 and mature cultures. And I'm like, this is a myth. Like, well, this he's, is... he's commenting on human culture and human culture is is composed in large part of myths alongside material realities, alongside the intermediate world of practical man-made objects. But he's, um, he's positing a myth as a norm that is not a historical norm. Yeah. I mean, he's doing the same thing. He like he's doing the same thing he's criticizing with the Neo Freudians with like the primal horde myth. Like. Like, for example, the idea that God's uh, of mercy, God's avengers turn into God's of mercy is not. There's a general tendency towards that in relationship towards the development of property in the actual age, if you read like the works of Richard Seifert, for example. Um, 
But also, the, we still got the hate gods usually in the same person. Like, and that's not just in Christianity, although where it's most obvious, where you have the loving God, particularly in Christianity, because, you know, you have the gods that's all good, and then that creates a problem of evil, which, like, sorry, Jews don't have it. We just don't have to worry about that kind of crap. Um, just we don't have an all good God. Easy way out of the question. <laughs> um, the there's just there's just this positing here of like you know look at this tendency towards revenge but if we could integrate it you know it'd be great i'm like yeah that's that is a freudian myth though itself that the culture has moved for progressive integration which i find interesting because I, I actually think that's in conflict with Lash in 88. Because, because in this, he's actually positing something like moral progress in that last chapter, in that last three paragraphs. I mean, I, I don't think he, uh, he thinks moral progress is impossible. I think he thinks moral progress is distinct from what's commonly understood as progress. Right. I find the whole thing to be a mistaken categorization. Like, people, when I talk about early Lash, all you hear about me from praise. When I talk about late Lash, I find myself agreeing with him until he gets to the answer to the question. And I'm like, your answer to the question is fundamentally conservative. Let's bring back the stuff we like. But, like, in the mature, less shitty form of, like, you know, the we, we don't want the regressive, punitive, you know, misunderstanding of Jonathan Edwards' God. We also don't want... Um, we want an attitude, you know, characterized by gratitude. I mean, this is also liberal. This is uh, selecting, you know, doing a pick and choose. Yeah, uh, you want your right hard knee. You want your right. You want your. You want your brother's knee brother. You know, uh, Protestant liberalism of the 1940s back. That's what you want. Like that's why Reinhold Niebuhr plays such a role for him in this late work and. What I find interesting is Niebuhr's absent in his early work, which I, I do get why people thought maybe he converted to some kind of Protestant Christianity. But we don't have evidence for that. Like, I, you know, I read the bio. Bio is written by a Christian. Still, they, they still can't prove that Lash was a Christian. He doesn't really try to. He doesn't know. Right? So it's like, is he pulling the Jordan Peterson thing? Like, we must believe in God even though we don't. Like, because of the social results of that and it, if that's the case it is conservative or it's 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 a conservative it's a it's a it's an attempt to re, to return to a prior form of liberalism yeah um i mean i think it's it's not so much we have to believe in god even though we don't it's we have to want to believe in god um, even though we don't believe in god and thus why would we want something we don't like <laughs> I mean, well, that's what he's saying. It's the divide between uh, between uh, unlimited aspiration and limited possibility or whatever it says. Uh, yeah, the gulf between human aspirations and human limitations. See, to me, Lash ends up mirroring through his Freudianism and uh, uh, Alester McIntyre. Yeah. Uh, except Alester McIntyre actually does try to adopt a truly pre-liberal worldview starting with virtue ethics and then going back like let's reinvent let's try to get back to Aquinian ethics which even the virtue ethics people like i was reading um and this is by a conservative catholic but it's actually a pretty brilliant book uh and it's not rooted just in the critique of uh of the lester mcintyre who, like, by the way, is like one of my favorite thinkers. Like, I, I after virtue, I think, is basically where I get my ethical theories from, even though I'm not a Catholic at all. Um, but I, I actually think the critique that was written about the whole uh, neo Aquanian virtue ethics movement uh, before virtue, assessing contributive vir virtue ethics by Jonathan Sanford. Like it points out that they really haven't been able to deliver on their critique of really revitalizing, uh, like an Aquanian worldview. Yeah. Um, which is which is what I mean. That's why Alistair McIntyre like rejects the term communitarian. Well, the, the funny thing about the term communitarian is nobody 
who gets labeled a communitarian from Sister. last yeah, from Lash to Averni to anybody says they're actually a communitarian. The only person who kind of accepts it is Taylor and Sandell, one liberal, one kind of anti-liberal, but still kind of liberal. Like uh, Sandell conceives of himself as like a like an anti-liberal, liberal left wing or something. I don't know how that works, but that's what like he kind of what you know. He's against markets. He's against the cult of authenticity. Uh, like he thinks he, he thinks basically the liberal communitarianism of Charles Taylor is Canadian brainwash. I mean, he wouldn't call it that, but like, um, but then, you know, with Sandell, you get a similar problem where like there's kind of political economic analysis, but then really he thinks that that political economic analysis actually fully descends from culture, not the other way around. And uh, Lash is interesting to me. Because in a real sense, Lash can't... I don't think Lash ever decides which one he thinks is primary. Like, he he always argues that the problem with populist and to some degree the problem with Marxist is they don't take culture seriously enough. Or they see it entirely as epiphenomenal. But then he's always portraying out how the culture of theorists start taking, like, what material. we would call social... Yeah, material reality or social reproduction all that seriously. Um, but then at the end, what does he, po what, what does he posit? It's a cultural answer... And I, I, uh, Shell and Montana, I argued about this per privately, but I'll air this this argument where I said I think his problem is literally his discipline. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he has, uh, I think he could have benefited from a background in economics or law, um, because he outsources all that to other thinkers, and and particularly the later you get in his work, like we get more and more in cultural analysis, even though. He often does see the lack of economic. I think he actually moves back to economics in the next two books uh, pretty substantively, um, especially actually in Revolt of the Elites. Um, he is moving very strongly back into economic analysis. Yeah, uh, which very, makes... it's very rudimentary. It's like, here is what trade balances are like. You know, here right, is. He goes what... back into economic analysis, but actually, interestingly, he does what he critiques the populace for doing in his early work. Like his, his, like, and, and truly only heaven, he's trying to redeem the populace, but he admits their faults. Yeah. And the revolt of the elites, he picks up their methodology, which in his earlier life, he said was too vulgar. Like the methodology of like all economics, you know, like, it's just like, ideology is the result of economic uh well he he actually yeah he says that that it has a tendency toward conspiracy theory because it has a very overly simple view of follow the money that it doesn't have yeah. a complicated analysis of that i mean i I, I have a lot of complaints of lash's myths i i don't see that personally in revolt of the elites i think that he's uh he's trying to do this very complex interplay on elites and I assume if he had been in better health, it would have resulted in like a better book. My, um, my version, of, my my problem with that book is like there's so much missing from it that you can kind of project what you want to make it work. That's absolutely true. Um, like, I mean, and it's got a lot of sections which have like problems, uh, which arises from similar stuff to the stuff we're talking about here, which is like his myth making and how he gets more and more reliance on it as a means of political activity yeah every now and then i want to bring his daughter for that but i've actually been told by people who have interviewed her that that's unfair that he doesn't that she didn't seem to alter the text that much i mean and, she I, I listened to her interview with todd a while back uh -huh. and it was like pretty nice she was like oh my dad was nice he cared a lot about work and people controlling their own destinies you know like interestingly um, i think her work in the 90s on like racial stuff is actually pretty good her current work is more I'm despairing. Let's go back to the classics. <laughs> like, like, yeah. you know, that's what you do. If you're, if you're a classical liberal, who's given up, you regress back to Greece and Rome. Like, <laughs> like, um, you know, you, you pull the 19th century thing and you start like, let's go back to the classics, but not like the like not the classics is understood by themselves. The classics is re-understand them as part of this Western civilizational project, which we kind of made up in the 18th and 19th century. Like, so. 
<laughs> um, that's actually kind of why I appreciate uh, the the like neo Thomistic turn of like Alester McIntyre because he's not trying to like like go back to the true foundations of Western culture because he knows damn well it isn't there. Like, um. And I think there is something like one thing I'm going to say is I think Lash is right about something that I don't think Marxists always deal with enough because they don't see Christianity as a political economic system um, of which prior to modernity it was. Um, Christendom is a thing for a reason and has an underlying political economy, which is not a particularly coherent one. But I mean, what is like it's not like capitalism is always going here either. Um, but there is a there is a, a political economic order tied into medieval Christianity um, explicitly and when it falls apart and it falls apart it starts to fall apart before capitalism quote capitalism but it's the beginnings of like our modern notions of race or modern like all kinds of things start to fill that gap right and I think Lash kind of intuits that but it's kind of a very basic almost mythic intuition because he's not a specialist in that time period of history i mean he's really a he's a historian of like 19th and 20th century history you know that's what he does um so you know he's a historian of the of the contemporary and what led to the immediately contemporary which was is why i find his early book so important for leftists to read because he does reground the American left in American political, economic, and cultural trends, which most modern leftists do not do. They ground them in European, uh, econo- ironically, for all the complaint about Eurocentricism, the, the predominant move of the American left from the 70s forward is to ground themselves in European thought, not in American thought. Um and not even in the intersection of American and European thought, like just trying to like, let's just, you know, importation straightforward, you know, what do we learn from theory? It's like Americans, then we go to France and we just don't deal with anything like, so that's interesting. Um, you, you know, you are leftist with a mild communitarian bent, I think. Um, yeah. I sniff it on you. Smell well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm I'm Jewish. I'm from a Jewish family, uh, you know. Um, and you're and you're you're rebelling against the name of the father is to not pick up their their mid their mid century Jewish liberalism. No, I'm I'm I mean I'm I'm not I I don't think I'm particularly rebellious in any way actually. Uh, <laughs> as as bequeaths your nihilistic generation, which has nothing to rebel for or against. No, uh, no, I mean. I look, I, I believe in stuff. Uh, yeah, but you do. <laughs> I, I like my generation. I think that people are nice. They're doing the best they can. So, so here's, what, here's what I think. I actually really like young people right now. We're all very nice. but You're all very, very nice. And, and you're pretty moral. We could use a harder edge sometimes, I think. Yeah, I, but I, I do think like uh, you don't believe in – you. you the manifestation of not believing in anything is is actually weirdly in the niceness because like it's morality it been to plurality for its own sake and tolerance right. for its own sake. Which which what I'm actually like I'm a believer in plurality and tolerance, like, but not for its own sake. Like and, and look, I don't think that I don't think like my generation is like my generation whether you count me as a Gen X or a millennial is a lot better. And on, on certain things, I think there has been a marked improvement on a lack of interpersonal cruelty, uh, which I think actually my, my reason for this is like, well, the consequences for it are eternal now. It's not like anyone gets to forget it, um, which I guess it, the funny thing about a society with no party of the superego is the Internet kind of does that for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in a way that so I, I don't know if that's super ego. It's more, uh, I, I, or I don't know. I mean, it feels like the super ego and the id collapse into one thing on the internet somehow, and I'm not like sure how that works. Oof, that's like, narcissism, Barn. You just oh. described narcissism. 
<laughs> oh God, you're right. There's no meaningful distinction between self and other. So there's no meaningful distinction to, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I like to, to joke that I'm, that I chide you so much because maybe in trying to prove me wrong, you're, you'll save your generation from their, from their ASO sociality. Uh, I'm very social, but I, or I try my best, but yeah, I know it's, I think you are naturally, but also do it to spite me. Um, uh, because <laughs> we're always harping on how uh, Zoomers and younger millennials are like asocial creatures. But notice I'm saying asocial, not antisocial. I think people need to understand the difference. I don't think that like, like Gen X is antisocial if we're going to characterize a generation meaninglessly, right? If we're going to posit a generational archetype and myth, uh, the Gen X archetype is antisociality. Um, and the millennial to Z would be a sociality, right? But notice I just made this shit up on the fly. See, this is easy to do. Um, it's fun too. Like, yeah, this is my, this is a lot of my problems with like psychoanalytic theory. It's like, I can just bullshit with it. Like I can come up with categories. That I can rigorously analyze the world through a lens that I made up on the fly. Like, which is useful to learn. You know, it's useful to learn, like, you learn analytic, weirdly, you learn analytical rigor doing this stuff, but you're also making up your categories ad hoc as it's convenient to you. <laughs> um, so, but I do think you're right that, that narcissism and the way Lash means it, not in the narcissistic personality disorder way, I want to make that very clear that Lash would not think these are the same thing, um, is kind of a general trait of everyone after the generations he's concerned about, which is really the baby boomers and their immediate kids. Um, we are like, we are the, the generation, like I am the dividing line of after that, like almost literally, um, you know, I'm born in the time period Lash is dying. So I find that interesting because a lot of what he describes actually does remind me of the world I grew up in. And then I see it now and I see it everywhere. But I, all, I part of me goes, and this is part of my resistance to Lash. Like, you know, I love Lash. He's incredibly crucial to my thinking. But I also push against him a lot. Because some of these are too easy. If I can find everything now that he thinks is specific to certain time periods, and I can find it anywhere, is his categories too broad? Well, that's the, uh, the thing he was talking about with historicization and Marcuse mm -hmm. all over again. Right, it's like but, you feel like he he doesn't see it in himself, but he sees it in Marcuse. Well, I mean, he's also not making a claim about permanency. That's us putting these categories, for example, in someplace else. Uh, I do I do think he sometimes fails to historicize properly, but in this case, like this is us not historicizing him. Right. Well, agreed. But that's that's one of the things that when I when I teach when someone asks me go do a speech and last the first thing I say about cultural narcissism is it's not actually about you, you're so vain. I bet you think culture of narcissism is about you, don't yeah. you? Yeah, don't you? Like, but it's kind of true because it's not about us. It's about our parents in my case, and in your case, your grandparents, I guess. Well, I don't know. Maybe your parents. I don't know. Maybe, who knows? My but, parents are Gen Xers, and my grandparents are silent Gen. Ah, uh, well. See, my grandparents are greatest generation and my parents are baby boomers. So he's talking about my parents. Like, um, poor silent gen. No one remembers them. I can't even keep them and lost gen separated. I always flip yeah. those ones, which, uh, but, um, this is interesting. What is interesting to me, though, about, generational politics all right uh we talk a lot about it people think i'm obsessed with it but also i kind of don't believe in it except that i think the baby boomers is a material category and generational politics after that emanates from that like our social institutions all change to accommodate the baby boom um, that's what drives credentialization it's just so many damn people and kids and that's expanded on when immigration yeah. is is yeah, we had, later on. 
we had 30 glorious years of social atomization, carbon democracy, uh, cheap education, a viable social welfare state, you know, sort of, uh, mostly through private uh, expenditure, actually. Uh, and ironically, it's the conservatives who, who you know, are against immigration, who relax immigration to maintain that. We, I think people don't miss that, but they're like they were trying to maintain part of the economic structure of the baby boom when there weren't the people anymore. And the way to do that was, well, we'll create an underclass, basically. Yeah. Um, and Europe explicitly did it with their guest worker programs. Like, um, and to think that we, that doesn't material affect the generations after, even in our attitudes around wealth accumulation, because... From Gen X to your, I don't, we, we don't know about your generation, but we can assume it's going to be worse. Um, you have progressively less ability to have wealth accumulation except for the very richest. Yeah. Median rent in New York is like 3600 a month now. You can't accumulate wealth with that. I mean, you can't move into a house. <laughs> my, my, my whole point, what I point to people is like, I have moved up in educational status and in, and, in, and supposedly in earning power to hold standard deviations on the liberal social scale from my parents to not have the same things they had. You know, like, like my mother was homeless, but after her first marriage was able to get together enough to buy a house. That's, you can't imagine doing that now like a, a, a mechanic and a waitress buying a house big enough to have multiple children in and i mean it was a shitty house don't get me wrong i mean it wasn't that shitty i don't shouldn't talk about it. but like it was a small house it was not but any house now now that's been true in europe for a long time so europeans are probably just like oh americans you were all rich like yeah no you know it's, we're not really comparing the same things but um, it's hard to imagine that now. And in that, you know, Lash's description seem real. But, and you're right that his, his, his cultural positing is kind of like his ideal. He doesn't really think, he, he doesn't seem to know how you get back to it. Um, and increasingly, I think in his 80s writings, he's like, doesn't even, he, he seems to want to have it both ways, actually. Like to me, that's a realistic critique of him that we see, kind of mm -hmm. the end of this book. Like, and that's frustrating because I, you know, I I'll, I'll rant and rave for three hours about that Takun essay, um, the first one where he attacks the conservatives and the second one where he attacks the left, and then I agree with him about the frustrations of people using class consciousness to just like throw out actual working class opinion and. And not address working class problems. Like I said, I'm totally with him on that. But when he talks about like working class families and working class traditionalism, like you're making that up. Like it's not like that's, you know, and then it's like asserting it on the authority of like anthropology says. And I'm like, not by 1987, it didn't. Like, yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's <laughs> desperately trying to find a politics that corresponds to his ideal of selfhood based on tension and aspiration and a guilty conscience and unfortunately it really does not exist <laughs> um and i actually think that the funny thing about that is like for a lot of people i know or i i think a lot of people who get serious about lash and there's like maybe four people in the world uh, this ideal of selfhood does become very appealing as a personal, a, a means of personal conduct. Um, though it's also hard to do because selfhood is actually, uh, you know, culturally reliant in some ways, uh, including on the construction of a culture that surrounds a, a, a selfhood premised on a guilty conscience, which doesn't exist again. But, you know, like it, it's, it's hard to find any place doing this thing politically, which is the reason why it's so unsatisfying and so non-intuitive, I think, because if we could connect it to anything in American politics, 
we'd say, oh, okay, even though it's insane, in the same way that we say, oh, okay, to all of the insane things from the party of the superego, the party of the ego, and the party of Narcissus. But this is just conjecture because it doesn't have any material base. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's actually correct. And I think that's, that's why I've never been able to go full communitarian, even though I, I will also admit I have communitarian impulses. I'm like, um, one of the things I've always been obsessed with, uh, from my point on the left is like, you know what guys, the right's better at building community, but I was talking to, um, uh, Erica Robeles Anderson about this. And we both noticed, you know, she was talking about uh, multi-level marketing and she was actually saying, well, is it any more exploitative than, than, uh, you know, credentialization? I'm like, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no, actually the, the, it's in some ways more exploitative, but the risk is lower, believe it or not. Um, you, you, you rarely, to, you rarely long-term economically devastate yourself off of a multi-level marketing scheme. Um, it does occasionally happen, but it's pretty rare. Whereas you can pretty lifetime economically devastate yourself with a bad schooling decision. Um, that, that said, the one thing that I, we were talking about, like the social innovation of mega churches, how they were better at, at integrating women and stuff, stuff Flash would probably like, and talking about how the left need to learn to that. We both noticed that it all ended with the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Like that's when that really started to break down. And that's what actually, you know, and I, I didn't push back on her with this because I actually like some of her points, but I was thinking, you know, that was why I thought mega churches were a sign of secularization, even though they were super innovative and, and better at a lot of things in traditional churches, they actually indicated that they needed to be to continue to survive. Um, but I do sometimes admit that it's frustrating, like, Conservative media tends to have a larger female audience than left-wing media, even though women are not particularly conservative. Why is that? Like, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and that doesn't seem related to Lash at all, yet somehow I feel like there's something in what Lash is struggling with feminism, some of which I think you can account to his perhaps sexist, very much too literal view of Freudian dynamics. But there is something there about the way a lot of the left both valorizes but is not attractive to a female audience like there is something in that and i i can't really tell you what exactly um and it's not that there's no i mean there are plenty of women on the left but like if you look at people who engage in leftist media projects engage in leftist theory even engaged in a lot of like the political end of leftist organizing, not the social end, which does tend to social activists do tend to be women. No, I, uh, I, will, I mean, I will. did I cut out again? You cut out the exact wrong moment. Go ahead. I was, I was going to say that uh, the squad is is women, basically. Uh, yeah, but they're women who represent the most male demographic of politics. I'm I'm just pointing. Out, I'm just adding on to what you're saying. Like, right, yeah. Yeah, like, with the, but that that I I've rubbed my hand around that part of me. I think it's like a defensive gesture. Yeah, but I don't think it's just that. Like, and I don't think it's the feminization of beta cock men. Like, that's not what I think is going on. Really, if you've ever dealt with leftist men, they're just as toxic as any right wing pro anyway. Um, particularly if they're my generation. <laughs> but, um, uh. Maybe there's hope for you, Zers and millennials yet, but uh, but yeah, I don't know what I was getting on there. But there is something about the ambivalence on a post nuclear family life that we don't really speak to, even when we talk about social reproduction or something like we don't. I don't know. I don't. I I can't articulate it. I'm the wrong person to articulate it. But it seems like. That's the real part of what Lash is struggling with, with with this whole femininity issue is in some ways he's right that a lot of like left 
um, visions of what a female informed world, it just collapses into the same thing. And uh, I mean, today, I think a lot of people would say that's a good thing. But and I don't even know that I disagree with them, but there does seem to be something not dealt with there. And it's really hard to articulate, which is why I've been babbling for 15 minutes. Maybe so, this can be the next episode. Yeah. Actually, maybe we should talk about Lash and Women because this is... It. And it's interesting that my female interlocutor, of all the people that I talk about Lash about, is the one who pushes hardest on me about being too hard on Lash about his attitudes towards women. Like, he thinks... She thinks I am judging him by, like, modern Nandy Pamby left feminist standards. And I don't think I'm doing that, but but uh, but I think that I, I like that that in and of itself has always been like, why am I the person who's like getting annoyed with this uh, way he talks about women? Even though a lot of times I factually, particularly in the early books, I think he's actually correct, like about what early like what early Western feminism. And by that, I mean literally Western as in Western of the United States. Like, why is Utah and Nebraska and all that where women voters come out of? And it's actually a kind of conservative impulse. Yeah. Like, Varm, um, I, sorry, that was like a hint. It's midnight here. So oh, I really good. have to go. Good night. <laughs> good night. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for talking to me for three hours. I'd agree. Um, yep. All right. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.